listening to the bomb. <laughs> It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb. You're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right. We got a big episode for you guys today at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer. First things first, Stony Buds, how are you doing? So good, my dog. Whew, that's a good one. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie Anderson's in the booth today. Jamie, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks. We are so happy that you're here. And for our listeners that don't know who you are, which is probably zero listeners, I'm going to do a little uh, little book report that I wrote on you. So Jamie Anderson's impact on snowboarding is unrivaled. She's one of the most influential people to ever strap in. She has dominated the competitive snowboarding scene for the past 15 years. She competed in her first X Games at 13 years old. She's a three-time Olympian, two-time Olympic gold medalist. She has 21... X Games medals. She's an advocate for what she believes in. She has a great nonprofit. She's a spiritual being, a soon to be mother, and an inspiration to us all. She is the goat of our sport. Now let's get into it. We got Jamie Anderson in the booth. Oh, goodness. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. First question More nervous for Jimmy Kimmel or Bombhole? Which one? Uh, Bombhole. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, Jimmy. <laughs> Love that. Oh, so nice to be here. Thank you for that intro. It was very sweet. Well, long time coming. Glad you finally made it to us. So what brings you to Utah? Why are you, why are you in town in the first place? Um, I was here for a Woodward event. Yesterday we did a charitable event uh, called Jamie's Jam. In cooperation with my charity, the JA Foundation, we sponsored 10 young girls. Woodward's like new initiative is to get young girls and women into action sports and kind of create a more inclusive environment. So um, through the SOS Foundation, they kind of helped find underprivileged girls that needed gear and wanted to get out there. So Union, GNU, Dekine, Oakley, they all sent a bunch of swag. So we kitted the girls out head to toe. And did a little shred session. And to come here and see you guys because <laughs> it's a long time coming. Sorry it just took until I was pregnant and had more <laughs> time in my life. But, I'm yeah, I'm really happy to be here with you. Thanks for having me on this show. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I kind of want to dive right in. Smack dab right in the middle of eight kids. Holy moly. Could imagine what growing up in the Anderson household was like. It sounds like like a Mormon family almost, right? (laughs) I know. You would think. The Brady Bunch over there. I think my parents were just pretty like free-spirited and I don't think believed in birth control. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Gosh, so fun though. I wouldn't change anything for the world. My dad is from California and my mom is an East Coaster. She grew up in Vermont. And yeah, she made her way out west, was living down in Santa Barbara, and had always heard of Tahoe, made her way up to Tahoe, met my dad. They um, got pregnant right away, so then they quickly got married, and then, yeah, had a big family. And thankfully, we they had a moment where they were going to live in Wyoming. Um, I think my dad was, like, in between jobs and, like, kind of trying to make it work, and Something led them back to Tahoe. He ended up getting a job at the fire station, and they raised our family in Myers, which is like a little town outside of South Lake, right at the root of um, Sierra and kind of close to Kirkwood. What resort did you grow up riding as a kid? I grew up at Sierra at Tahoe. It was like 10 minutes up the road, and we could hop on the bus. My mom got her degree in teaching, but she wasn't a big fan of the school system, so we all got to do homeschool, and (laughs) now that I look back at it, it was kind of like her style of, like, Waldorf. Like, we did a lot of art, and we spent most of our days outside playing. She wasn't really strict on, like, reading and writing right away. She knew, like, that would come, Um, and yeah, I feel so grateful. We had such a fun childhood. Lots of girls in our family, six girls and two brothers. And yeah, snowboarding was honestly like not really (laughs) in the deck of cards with that many kids. My dad loved skiing, but we couldn't really afford 
season passes and all the gear. That actually came a little bit later through a family friend, Mickey Warren, who was a young mom. She was 25 and had a 10-year-old. And they gave my sisters all their hand-me-downs, and then I quickly grew into their hand-me-downs. And that's kind of how snowboarding got into our life. Well, so there wasn't that much money, huh? You guys had to just get what you got and make it work. 100%. Like, we were really, we had everything we needed. My parents worked hard and had, like, a beautiful home for us to be in. But as far as sports for that many kids, like, they really are a privilege, especially something like skiing and snowboarding. Like, it's really, really expensive. You imagine the bill on eight setups and jackets. <laughs> you and imagine? <laughs> so Gotta get I, a loan. Yeah, yeah, it's just too much. So it encouraged us to just hustle. Like we all worked for my mom's lawn care business in the summer and would just save cash. And then my older sister helped us make resumes and we would try to like get sponsors when we were pretty young. We started doing the USASA events. And yeah, I think not having everything so handed to us, even though of course hand-me-downs and things were given to us, it gave us that ambition to just work harder and really like appreciate and value every day we got to spend on the mountain. And yeah, it was really fun. We have a guest question from your sister, Joni. Here we go. Joan. Hi, Jamie. It's Joni. So you were hustling at a pretty young age. I remember you riding bikes from our house to the golf course and swimming in the river for golf balls that the golfers had lost and then selling them back to the golfers. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you made a pretty good amount of money. So my question is, what did you do with all that money? <laughs> she knows exactly what I was doing with that money. <laughs> um, gosh, yeah, I was pretty young, like, you know, early teenage years and I think that was pretty much like my weed fund, selling golf balls back to the, back to the golfers. That's a good and hustle right there, those, I those was, balls. I was just ambitious. I loved making money. My parents, like, we didn't really have allowances. They definitely, we all had to do a ton of chores and, like, make the house work. And I remember some of my friends getting, like, money given to them, and I just, like, I didn't comprehend. I was like, wait, like, your mom just gave you, like, 50 bucks, like, allowance? What is this? Like, never heard of that. <laughs> um, but now that I look back at it, I'm so grateful that I didn't have that because it made me, like, think outside of the box and, like, learn to be independent and make money, you know? It's kind of all just energy and frequency. So between, like, the golf ball hustle, which I love swimming in rivers, so it was, like, it was so fun. It's my favorite thing to do as a kid. Your sister mentioned that you raced BMX as a kid and you used to mop up the boys. Is that true? <laughs> For sure. I would, uh, <laughs> I would kick the boys' ass, especially before puberty. Everything changed after that. But when I was, yeah, I think like eight, nine years old, I started BMX racing. And I, I guess I have always been competitive. I didn't really know that, but... Yeah, I loved it. It was really fun. They would get so pissed, and I had, like, all the gold trophies, and I put them all over my room. I was pretty proud. Incredible. Hey, Buds, we got a Patreon question about uh, family members, right? All right. We have a Patreon question from Johnny Thorne, but this is a special Patreon question. Um, Chris is actually going to be giving away a pair of Oakleys, huh? Yeah, we got uh, this guest question is presented by Oakley. We got a pair of Oakley goggles, a pair of Oakley sunglasses. Uh, I run the Oakley Line Miners. Uh, I also run the Oakley Mod 1 Pro Helmet, new to the Brain Bucket game. I know Jamie rides for Oakley, too. What, uh, what's, your, what's your setup? Yeah, I'm down with the Line Miner. It looks like those might be the special Olympic edition, which is a pretty steezy frame. Um, yeah, I love them. They're comfy. Prism lens all day long. Let's go. The prism goes. Prism. It, it actually turns darkness into light. That's what I've heard. <laughs> yes. Uh, so. And if you're a Patreon member, you know you get opportunities like this, like Johnny. Who's this? So who won this? This is Johnny Thorne, and he wins with the question: I know you you are from a big family. Who is your favorite sister? Oh, Johnny. Oh gosh. Um, I wouldn't say I have a favorite. I love all my siblings. They're really my best friends. 
on this show, you have to have a definitive favorite. Oh, my gosh. Should I make a shout out to Joan, my my fellow uh, competitive snowboarder girl? <laughs> we won our first X Games medals together, and it was a pretty, like, pretty powerful moment. She went on to become a Chinese doctor, and now she helps me, like, stay balanced when things get out of whack. That's special. I was watching you on the Ellen show, and you mentioned that at nine years old, Joni told you snowboarding is 90% mental. Do you believe that? For sure. I think anything in life is more mental than anything. Yeah, she said anything you want to do, it's like it's 90% mental, 10 physical. Anyone has the possibility. It's a matter of like who and how strongly you believe. And that definitely integrated through most of my life. So if I'm thinking like I can take Mike Tyson, nine, like I'm like, you know what? I can do this. My mind is set that I have a 90% chance of knocking this guy out. 100%. As long as he doesn't bite my ear off, we're good. All right. And you, you got to put in work, too. You got yeah. to put, put in some work. All right. But, yeah, that's good stuff. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit. 13 years old, competed in your first X Games. Thinking back to that time, you were a little kid. What was going through your head when you were 13 doing your first X Games? Oh, gosh. When I was 13 going to X Games, I was pretty fired up. I, I couldn't believe it. You know when you're 13, you actually think you're, like, 20? Like, now I look back at 13-year-olds, year old, and I'm like, wow, they're like children. But when I was 13, like, I had it all figured out. I had my golf ball hustle. I had the snowboarding coming up. When I made X Games, I was so ecstatic. Like, I just lost it. I didn't really love border cross, but that's what got me there. And I remember I actually went over to the park and I was watching like Travis Rice compete and I snuck into a practice, which is so like not kosher. I don't think I've ever hit jumps that big. And I was like, I watched a couple people like from the knuckle roll in and I dropped in. I was like, I got this. And I did like two turns and I literally decked the jump in the middle. <laughs> and you had snuck in. <laughs> and I was so humbled. I remember leaving that like, oh, my God, Jam. Like, what are you doing? Get out of there. Um, but, yeah, Border Cross got me there in the beginning. And they almost didn't let me compete because I remember I like barely weighed 100 pounds. <clears throat> they were like, this is like a danger. They were like kind of having internal discussions about it. <laughs> But I earned that spot. It was a last-minute qualifier with all, like, adult women at Sugar Bush. No, wait. What's it? Sugar Bowl? Sugar <laughs> Sorry. Bowl. Sugar Bowl in North Lake. And, uh, yeah, I won it. And then they are kind of, like, unsure. But, thankfully, I got to go. Sean Palmer gave me my first Troy Lee helmet. I thought it was pretty steezy. Wow. And everyone else was a full adult. Yeah. Everyone was full size. <laughs> And you're Can just we just thirteen year old? We, we got to back that up. Sean she Palmer just casually said, "Yeah, slip that in." Sean Palmer <laughs> gave her first Troy Lee helmet, which, whoo, that's that's <laughs> I, beautiful. I still was have this it. after you won? Uh, Full no, face. this Full was face. well. This was like between that qualifier and going to betwixt? X. Yeah, in wow. betwixt, yeah. in betwixt. So he had seen <clears> you, <throat> kind of. He had his eye on you and gave you this helmet. So he was kind of a family friend. My Palmer. oldest sister dated. Um, one of his best friends, so that's how we knew him. And, of course, from snowboarding, I always knew of Palmer. But, yeah, I was pretty, like, I was pretty honored and scared and all of the above. That's cool. So growing up in Tahoe, who are your early inspirations? Uh, early inspirations in Tahoe? I was so young, and, like, at that point in time, we didn't really have, like, a lot of access to, like, the pro snowboarding industry. So, like, I didn't really know that many pros a couple years later, I remember learning about Tara Dakitas, and I think I had her Vans poster, and I really admired her, saw her on X Games. Um, I really loved Barrett Christie, and then I learned about, like, Victoria Jalous and some other writers that I really, that I was really inspired by. Cool. Good inspos right there. Now, I'm going to change gears real quick, because we were talking, I was talking to your partner, Tyler, shout out. Tyler Nicholson, get, getting some intel for this uh, this podcast. And uh, I was like, what's Jamie into? She's like, you know, she's into like dream boards, <laughs> you know, manifestation going off. I want to know about these dream boards. <laughs> what's a dream board? <laughs> um, 
a dream board is or a vision board is something that you create. Like I've only made one before, but just kind of something where you can put your dreams and goals like on a wall. Kind of like this is like a dream board, like putting things that inspire you. Words of affirmations. Um, if there's like certain goals you're working towards, just to like integrate it into your mind, you know, some people like to write things on their mirror uh, to give them like some self-confidence or motivation. But my girlfriend, Christine, came over with all this artwork and we just like, yeah, we did like a little dream board session. She brought a bunch of magazines. She brought like a Nat Geo mag with like all these sacred places around the planet, which kind of stoked me out because I love traveling. But yeah, we did like little dream yeah, boards. What, what was on your dream board specifically? I put a, the word abundance because this is like an abundant time in life, I feel, creating a new life and a lot of change that sometimes can be pretty scary, but also really exciting. I mostly put like healthy food on it. Um, I had like this really beautiful spot in Nepal I want to go to. Um, uh, I, South America, I think it was Machu Picchu with an alpaca. <laughs> <laughs> so you put an alpaca on there? I had a horse on there. I really want to have horses in my life. So you what made this else? recently. Yeah, I made this just like last week. Nice time of the year to make it, you know? A little clean the slate. Not that time New really year. matters, but mm. it's January. And it's basically the first step of manifestation, correct? Yeah, I think so. And I did it before, and I remember it was going into that year of like Natty Select, and I like that was my number one goal to like – do well at that event and it totally didn't work out <laughs> so I'm not like I won't say it's like an give all but I think just like getting into the practice of like not being afraid to dream big sometimes it's hard to set goals and to even say things out loud because like inside you're like shit I don't want to like fail or I don't want to like dream too big and be let down but I think part of like evolving and growing is like being okay with letdowns and not like kicking yourself and just accepting the process. Maybe it takes many dream boards to manifest like your truest goals, but mm. fun to start. Ty said he was going to make one with me, but he hasn't. He hasn't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's, it's important. He's been manifesting. You know, he's got a plane. He's got a turbo. You know, he's been he's he's been manifesting some great stuff. Ty is definitely a dreamer. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I really love about him. When we first got together, we were just like so young and so ambitious and just like always talking about our dreams and goals and like a lot of things manifested like the house we live in in Whistler was totally out of just like we he lived in the most ghetto apartment in the beginning of our relationship and I'd go up there and like spend time there with him and Mikey Cicerelli and rent was so expensive but we'd still just I just wanted to be there to ride pow and ride the mountain it's such a beautiful place um and I'm like, God, we should get a house and, like, build a suite over the garage and rent out half of it to, like, pay for it. And, like, we really manifested, like, that exact type of property, even more beautiful than what I thought with, like, the mountains in the back and a little creek that goes through the yard. Um, but, yeah, he's really, like, he's ambitious. <laughs> That's exciting. I love that. Um, I, I want to stay on manifestation for a second here because... You're always manifesting. You know, we got a great mind here. We gotta, we gotta kind of lean into this. Lean in. Try to see, learn see a couple things. See yeah. what we can learn. <laughs> I'm so, sure our listeners and viewers want to learn too. When, when it comes to like Olympics and things like that, when you know you're like, all right, I'm going to the Olympics. I really want to do well, and you end up winning, right? Are Are you before? Are you manifesting like winning the X Games, winning the Olympics? Are you envisioning that? Hmm. Kind of like it's a tricky one for me, like manifestation and setting goals, like a big part that I've learned over the years is like setting that goal and intention. Like, yeah, for sure. When I went to the Olympics in Sochi, like I wanted to win that shit 100 P, but I also had to learn to like let go of the obsession and the attachment or expectation of it, because I think that's where it like dwells on you. And puts too much weight and pressure on like your light self where if you kind of can do it like I have a cool bathtub at my Tahoe house and I would have like 
I got pretty good at manifestations like that year. I would like write a lot of things and I'd always take baths. Like it was kind of my time to like meditate and chill out. And I had a lot of like pretty powerful affirmations there. So every night I would just like chill, light a candle and just like read that stuff. But in my the back of my mind, it wasn't like I have to go win. Like, you know, maybe the universe or God or higher power has like a different plan and you got to be OK with that. And I think if we're so caught in like tunnel vision, we miss a lot of other things along the way. But I do for sure believe that we are the creators of our reality and what we think we attract. It's like when you wake up and have a shitty start to your day, it kind of goes that way. And you can definitely break it, but it's all energy. Like if you wake up and you're feeling like happy and grateful and loving, like you're most likely going to attract that same vibe throughout the day but I think we have to learn for ourselves for everyone it's so different and um, I've had a lot of moments in life where I've been really not light and not happy and not content and it's kind of like a a downward spiral Um, but you got to learn through it all if it was all rainbows and sunshine it wouldn't be like so fun you gotta ebb and flow with it all and Try to find a little bit of medium ground, but like not be so low when times are tough and not be so high when things are good. Do you do the verbal stuff too where you like literally – Affirmation? Aff- yeah, you ask for it or talk – like put it out Ooh. there? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I feel a little cheesy, but like if I'm in a really shit situation or like struggling or like family or friends or like deathly hill or maybe you lose someone you love, like that's when I feel like you're – more open to be like wow like I need a little love and help and support or if you've ever been in like a crisis like a scary situation where like you actually have to like pray out loud that's where I think like the power is like I don't do it very often but when things get tough I'm definitely not afraid to like speak out I don't know exactly like I'm not religious by any means but I definitely believe in something greater than me and I'm not afraid to Uh, connect and like ask for a little support when I need it and a lot of times like what I've experienced is like nature showing up whether it's like a cool animal like sometimes like I'll be feeling away or say something and then boom like a bald eagle is flying over my truck while I'm like driving home from Mammoth I'm like that's what like that's it like the power you know but I think everyone connects with something in different ways you know that's what's so beautiful about life there's not just one way that works for everything there's so many ways you can connect and better yourself or feel feel aligned so uh i've seen that too i've been out maybe walking around in nature and all of a sudden you see a fox or something you're just like i'm in the right place i'm on the right path but i've recently had to take that the verbal affirmation, isn't that just praying? Isn't it the same thing? Mm-hmm. And maybe that's why these people that are very religious, which I'm not, I don't think you guys are either, they start praying and they do it out loud and it works. And so they they kind of lean into that and all of a sudden become religious and it's this big thing in their life. And I've decided that's just what manifestation is and and we do it a different way. And there has to be something, but... It's uh, just putting it out there, and that's, I don't know, just it's kind of something that's paralleled and been interesting to me lately, and uh, just kind of look into that more when, and understanding that what the religious people are seeing and why they get so hyped on it. And, I don't know. It's pretty pretty cool, and I guess listeners and viewers, try it and uh, ask for it out loud and see what happens. It's pretty crazy. I love Seems that. Seems to work, you know? Test the water. And what Chris is saying, too, you can't just ask for it. Like, I want $10,000. It doesn't work like that. You got to do something also to get you there. But the first step is putting it out there and attracting the right energies, like you were saying. A hundred percent. I love that. You I do think, that stuff with crystals, too, right? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I different. used to always have, like, a rock on me. I'm like, nature girl. But I haven't really... I now, I like beads lately. I've got a lot of like mala beads. Um, But yeah, any earth element. I love like finding feathers in nature or if you find a rock that is cool. Like I like things that can go back to nature that you don't have to have forever, you know, not synthetic. Just a connection, huh? (laughs) Yeah, just something that reminds you. Last year we were on a dirt biking trip in like northern BC and 
I like kept finding bald eagle feathers. Like never in my life had that happened. And I found like five or more feathers and I was kind of tripping. It was like a little omen. And, you know, I like took some and left some and gifted some. And yeah, I love nature. I think we have so much to learn from the simple things in life. I mean, we are just nature. We're just all swagged out and <laughs> have a kind of crazy ego and intellect. But when you like bring us back to the root, like we're we're no different than any other nature on this earth. That's a fucking amazing point you brought up too. And I kind of want to elaborate on that because I don't think I used to really see that when I was a kid. It was like I'm going snowboarding. That's one of the best things about snowboarding is you're in nature, you're in the mountains. And I used to not really look around. You'd be like there's a jump. I'm going to build a cheese wedge over here. or I'm just riding the park. And it's nice. I feel like a part of getting older and being more present and being more connected is you're up in the mountains and you're admiring the trees and you're admiring the mountain range from afar and you're admiring your environment and you're just appreciative to be where you are. And I think that also brings you to our natural state, which is presence. And when you're present in the space that you're existing in, there are no problems. There are no issues. There's no anxieties. There's no past. There's no future. You're just there. And that's one of the beautiful things about what we do is strapping in on a snowboard and sliding down a hill and doing this fucking glorified sledding that we <laughs> consider a job, which is a joke, <laughs> you know? But yeah. Oh, that's beautifully said. A hundred percent agree with that. You got to take that moment, right? And look around. Yeah. And it's, it's getting harder and harder to be in the present so easy to be tripping on the future regretting the past and yeah like that's where and anxiety comes from and depression and all these like things because we don't really know how to be present anymore so you have to do something like get in the mountains or maybe on a dirt bike I know you love to dirt bike or anything that bring like mostly sports for me and I'm probably a lot of the viewers that's kind of why you love it because you're not stressing on anything but what's right in front of you What's it like with a baby on the way? Is it hard to stay in your present zone? Are you always, uh, like, looking at that date coming up? Or I feel like having this pregnancy the last, gosh, almost eight months, I'm, like, 34 weeks now, it's, like, the most present I ever felt in my whole life. It's so cool. It's brought, like, for one, I've never really been sober for this long, and I really have been enjoying just, like, being really clear and conscious I've had stints of sobriety over the years, and I've tried to, like, do it, and it's been really challenging, especially in our industry and being pretty, like, uh, I don't know. Unfortunately, anytime I did good in, like, snowboarding, instead of celebrating with, like, a green juice and health, I'd, like, buy a bottle of tequila and just get go ham yeah, you win so. a gold medal right <laughs> it's like let's do this <laughs> um so it's been really cool to like and I've always been inspired to like be clear I you know always loved smoking weed I think that was a part of uh growing up in like the early 2000s and snowboarding it was pretty like common and now thankfully it's more like recognized as medicine and not so terrible but I think alcohol for me was the one that kind of brought like my lower vibration self and when I would take time away from it I'd always get so much clearer and like happier you know you don't really realize it's quite a depressant um but yeah I think just like this pregnancy has brought so much clarity and so much appreciation for women we're pretty incredible <laughs> And, yeah, it's been so cool, especially now that I'm, like, I can actually feel the little love. First, like, the first most of the pregnancy, you're kind of just, like, filling in, just look a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> but this last couple of months, I've, like, really felt the little one can feel, like, just, I don't know, Kick pureness. And yeah. And, like, I'm more tired, so I just, like, relax more and kick my feet up and... Um, this is like the first trip I've done in months. I've mostly been like chilling in Tahoe and Whistler and just for once like organizing my life, doing a lot of reflecting on myself and kind of where I want to go going forward and thankfully not too worried about the future, but I am excited to meet the little one, but I'm enjoying my like my time on my own or time with just Tyler. 
And you were saying you guys uh, don't know the sex, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, gosh, there's like no more surprises in life. And that's the first thing everyone asks. They're like, oh, you're pregnant. Are you having a boy or girl? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, Figure you don't out. know? Yeah. I'm like, no, I don't fucking know. <laughs> so you're going to wait till that it happens. Wait until they're born. And then figure out a name then and there? Or have a couple female and male names? And I, yeah, I don't know. That's Honestly, got some, the names, names are tough. Yeah, give me some ideas. Chris and I could probably come up with some names, you know? Yeah. Something. You know, I'm, I like old fashioned. I like Gary, Bill. You know what I mean? <laughs> Bartholomew, something yeah. weird like that, maybe. <laughs> I know. Gosh, I had a hard time naming my dog. I don't yeah, know right? what the hell we're going to name our human. <laughs> you know, Chris went Phil. That's perfect. It's... My dog's name is a person name. <laughs> yeah. So you could try some. You try could a try a dog name. name. You'd like Otis. You could do Otis. <laughs> That's or pretty cute. Buddy. Yeah, Buddy. Buddy, 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 Buddy would, be, would good... be a great one. Hey, yeah, Bud. I think you'd go dog name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dog name. That could be the future. Oh, mm-hmm. my gosh. Sparky? So Female fun. dog name is a tough, tough go. Yeah, yeah. I felt like if it's a boy, like Ty can have more of like Let free him range. get in there. He's already naming the babies. Like, how's how's little Leo? How's He's trying baby? out how's, names. I'm like, settle down. I'm the one holding this baby. I'm start naming. No. But um, yeah, if it's a girl, I want to name her. If it's a boy, he can kind of take the range, but we'll still like, come maybe. together. I like a lot of like the earthy hippie names. My sisters have named their kids like Winter Joy, River Ray, Mabel, Zephyr, August. Like cute kind of names they kind of took a lot that i like but yeah that's a those are interesting names yeah earth, no, earth child something like that um, earth child I don't could really, be good yeah, yeah i don't know that a lot of those hippie names i was thinking spawn of t-dog and jamie like that's your kid <laughs> no i'm not that bad as a name but i'm yeah, just saying okay. like a, this, this is a spawn of tyler nicholson jamie anderson this baby mm-hmm like is going to be doing back tens at age what four five? <laughs> what are we thinking here? I wonder. We were even talking like, what if our kid just wants to do other stuff? What if mm, little one wants to like surf or be an artist? Like it's so cool bringing a little one in. I'm so curious. Hopefully they'll like to do the things we like to do. I f- foresee like just having a fun life. I'm so excited to like slow down a little bit. I don't know if I ever would have stopped sending it i was kind of addicted to the contest scene kind of addicted to making money (laughs) (laughs) but for years i was like 25 and then all you're gonna do is ride pow and then 25 came and i had like just won the olympics and i was still pretty on top of my game and it was just starting to get fun then like there's actually a lot of like really strong competition for a long time i was kind of in cruise control like barely even trying um and now it's like I have to Hail Mary my runs, and, like, a lot of times it's tricks I haven't even tried in practice, and I'm just, like, saving my energy to, like, toss a front 10, which I'm terrified of. Um, But, yeah, the girls have really, holy shit, they've leveled up. (laughs) It's It's serious out there. It's really cool to see where women's snowboarding is going. So as a mom, do you see yourself being more of just a mom and living a nice, chill life, or are you going to get back out there? I think I'm going to be a pretty fun, like, adventurous mom that's awesome. i love like maria thompson and pelosi like there's some pretty powerful women that you think you have a kid and like life's over but i'm actually feeling really inspired like maybe it's gonna make me even more tapped into my true self and like your real power and especially with like the clarity i feel right now i couldn't imagine like last year going into the olympics if i wasn't partying so hard I kind of think I could have done a lot better. Mm. But, you know, I was dealing with so much stress and didn't really want to go to China and felt for, like, the humanitarian issues that were happening, felt for the environmental stuff, and, like, my heart wasn't in it. And because my heart wasn't in it, I was just, like, kind of self-sabotaging, drinking a lot, not having a spiritual practice, not really being not really taking care of myself and it showed so much even though I had moments last season like winning the first event of the year and still getting double silver at x I was really proud of but I was like I wasn't like on par with what I knew I was capable of it was uh but it was so much learning and like being able to go to an Olympics after winning two and knowing I was in the mix like definitely on the podium mix if I landed my runs it was uh I think it was just what I needed to like not do good and have that humility 
And even though it was really hard to work through as I've grown and like flash back at it, like I wouldn't change anything. And I trust that like, even when things happen that aren't ideal, like it's okay. That's kind of how like, I do want to believe that things happen for you and not to you. And I don't want to be a victim of my own like bullshit choices or the things that happen and just know that because of that, I now I'm going to be a better version of myself. And then it feels better because who wants to live it? Like, yeah. Who wants to feel shitty, you know? Like we're all going to go through different things in life. And if we're always just like beating ourselves up, like where's the growth, you know? Mm. You have to kind of go down to come back up. You're like don't be the victim. It yeah. happened for a reason. That, totally. That, yeah, what I hear there, if I want to see if I'm hearing you right, because it sounds incredible too, because you say things happened for me, not to me. And that sounds like, you're coming from a space of letting go control, like acceptance of outcome. And I feel like when you let go of control and just accept the way things are and don't try to control every little thing, then then you're okay with outcomes that aren't desirable because you just accept them. A hundred percent. And don't we all want more peace in life? Yeah, right. A hundred percent. I think actually a lot of our culture is like addicted to sorrow and pity and like sadness because we obsess over things and it is, it's harder to be happy and like rise up than it is to be like, fuck this, fuck that. But I think the real power is like letting go of all those expectations and attachments. Like I remember right in slope style, like when I fell on my third out of three runs, I was just like so devastated in the moment. And as soon as I got to the bottom and like, Saw my friend Jules Marino in the freaking first place. Hasn't landed a contest run in years. It like instantly dissipated my self-pity and like poor me. And it just like literally lit my heart up with so much joy. And I, I'm i so fortunate that I've had so much success. Like how could I not be proud of these other girls? And then Zoe came down last minute, like laced her insane run. I was like... I was so joyous and so happy and that like it was so beautiful to see that like of course we all have ego and we all have our pride and our our own expectations but can we like get out of ourself and just be happy for others like that was my big takeaway and I was so proud of those girls and I was a little sad. I remember having a tall boy beer that night and it just made me like depressed. I was like, wow, why didn't I practice that 10 on that stupid side angle jump? Like I just thought I could manifest it. That's one example of it not totally working. (laughs) I was even talking to Ty. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do a front 10 on Twisted Sister. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, like 100% I'm doing it. He's like, are you going to practice it? And I did mean to practice it. It just was too freaking icy and cold. And I was so scared the whole time. Um, But yeah, when it finally came down to finals, I was like, I'm doing it. And I was close. Maybe a little bit of practice would have helped. But uh, yeah, the bigger picture is like being there for the other girls and being like a true, um, I don't even know the world, but trying to be a good example of like what I want to preach. And you can't always be on top. You got to like be okay with all of it and not let success dictate your peace of mind or your happiness Mm. it's easy to go to the olympics and win and be all like happy and stoked and going on jimmy kimmel or whatever the hell all those shows are it's harder to go there and like be completely defeated and still like keep your head up but i think that is exactly what my spirit needed for whatever reason and i'm really thankful for that experience and these other girls maybe needed it more than you and that's a great thing to be able to walk away happier for them and instead of angry. So that's, that's so a happy beautiful for place them. to be. Tess Cody on the podium, first one for Oz. Uh, I mean, you got 21 medals at home. Is that what you said in the <laughs> intro? That's a stack. You don't even know where to keep oh, 21 medals. There might be a couple lost. <laughs> yes, you got, you got some lost, and there's some <laughs> girls that don't have any. So that's pretty cool to. Yeah, you got to spread go. the love. Yeah, spread the love. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk about one of our sponsors, DB. They're a travel bag company, a travel brand from Scandinavia. They make board bags, roller bags, backpacks, all beautifully designed. They all link together so you can roll them to the airport. And we have Sage taking you through his signature collection. What's going on, everyone? Sage Kotzenberg here. 
This is my new DB collection. We've got the board bag. We've got the duffel bag. They link together so you can hook them up when you're hitting the airport or just traveling in general. It's really nice. And then this bag is made specifically for backcountry riding. It's got a checklist with everything you need in there. Uh, works really well. The material's awesome. We've been using it all the last two years. Check it all out at dbjourney.com. Hope you like it. I'm super stoked on it. Big love. All right, we got some big news coming at you from the bomb hole. Signups are live for the bomb hole cup, which is April 1st and 2nd at Brighton Resort right here in Utah. It's going to be a giant event. Most spectators Brighton had ever seen last year, according to Jared. So day one is a bank slalom for all ability levels. Day two is a park showdown. So we got a park jump, a bunch of rails. We got a limo. We're going to be jumping over all ability levels both days. So bank slalom is really cool. We got all different types of classes in accordance to age group or ability level. We got a pro class. We got an industry class. We have an adaptive class for the non-able bodied. We got a vintage boards class for boards pre-2000. We got age groups. We got Grom, 15 to 29, 30 plus, 40 plus, 50 plus classes. We got skiers on boards this year. So that's really fun. If you're a skier, you can't ski, but you can come snowboard. We have a split board race. So you split board up, race down. So fun if you're a racer, granola eating split boarder, all ability levels coming out for Bomb Hole Cup April 1st. And then day two is a park showdown. So we got open class. We got Grom. We got pro. The session is just absolutely electric. Last year was legendary. We want this thing to be a community building event. So if you're a member of the snowboard community and you want to meet new people, you want to meet pros, everybody's going to come hang out. If you're a listener of the Bomb Hole, come meet other listeners. It's our big event where our online community gets together for a couple days, April 1st and 2nd at Brighton. Again, signups are live, bombhole.com. And uh, hopefully we see you guys there. All right, Jamie, I want to run it back to your first Olympics, which was Sochi. Um, you basically went from a snowboarder, a well-known snowboarder, but relatively unknown in the grand scheme of the world, to an overnight celebrity, you know, going on... The Apprentice and all the talk shows. Was it difficult dealing with that fame at a young age? Um, hmm. Yeah, for sure. It was definitely like overnight life changing. I think like when I was going into the Olympics, I had like not many followers, like not even 10K. And like the next day it was like over 100K. And a lot more opportunities started to come. And I remember feeling like I was managing it, but it was pretty overwhelming. Like the last thing I wanted to do was move to New York to do The Apprentice, especially under Donald Trump. My agent had to like pretty much beg me for that one. And it was in March when all I wanted to do was snowboard. But <clears throat> you kind of have to strike when the iron's hot and do what you can. Um, I'm thankful for that experience. Uh, kind of like free college. We learned a lot about business in a quick amount of time. But yeah, that was overwhelming for myself. Just like I'm very much a nature person and I like to be out in the woods chilling and snowboarding. So going on like media tour to LA and New York, I was like, this sucks <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. And I look back on it too and you could see that like I wasn't, it's not like some people love that and they want to like have their stylist and hair and makeup done. I was like, get me out of here. Like, yeah, wasn't ideal, but I think I handled it pretty well. I tried to stay like pretty humble and grateful for the experience. There's like a lot of money to be made in those times. And coming up the way I did, I've always valued like my wealth and making money and mostly wanting to make money to share it with those in needs, kind of trying to share and play like Robin Hood and mostly with like family. I love to give back to my family and anyone in need. So whenever I would get an opportunity to like go to an appearance for 50 grand, there's no way I wasn't going to do it. And after that Olympics, there's a lot of things like that happening, like going to Beaver Creek to talk to a bunch of wealth advisors and it was like 40 grand for four hours. I was like, oh 
oh shit, like this is. There's some biscuits. How often are you doing these things? I am as often as I could. Like you got forty grand for four (laughs) hours. (laughs) And Beaver Creek, like staying in a super posh hotel, like. That's where I learned about Tai Chi. They had like a Tai Chi class. I was like, oh, this is kind of similar to yoga and other things I was interested in. Um, But yeah, I was doing that as much as I could. It's interesting thinking about being a victim of your own success because as you become more successful, you are almost taken away from snowboarding because you have so many opportunities like that that it seems like it can be all that stuff can be a distraction from your career did you hit your wall where you're like okay i'm doing too much doing too much kind of celebrity stuff i got to get back to my roots or did you just kind of cash in while you could um i would say after that first olympics in 2014 my life got so busy for the next couple years and all the girls who were like on my tail were like hustling to kick my ass like everyone knew what they needed to do to beat me So going back to Korea, I remember being like, oh, my God, like, what have I done in the last couple of years? Like so much work stuff and so little snowboarding, little yoga, little nature bathing. Like I definitely felt super stressed going into South Korea and all the added pressure of like defending gold medalist. And I knew everyone around me was working really, really hard and they had like better tricks and more technical rails and. <clears throat> I kind of had to flow with it. I was like, well, what's done has been done. Can't take back time. I'm going to just try to like handle this the best I can. And like, you, you know, you never know how events are going to go and like what's going to happen. But I did manage to have like a good state of mind at that event, even if like my riding wasn't as high as I would have liked it to be. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to balance all that. You know, you want to take opportunity of other op- other opportunities that come, <laughs> but you don't want to drain yourself and like get so far removed that you don't even feel like a snowboarder anymore. Mm-hmm. Bud seems like he's got a question. I'm just dying to know what was it like hanging with Trump? What's he like in person? <laughs> oh, Trump. Because wow, he's what a what a character. <laughs> he's a character for like sure. He must be crazy. Um, and that was like before he was obviously the president. I really wasn't so much of a fan of him just because, like, his persona, from what I knew, is just pretty, like, arrogant, pretty, like, rude. Um, But he was really nice to me. Like, he apparently loves athletes, so he came, like, right over to me at the welcoming dinner. He's like, hey, I saw what you did in Sochi, and, like, you you fucked up your first run, and then you got back up there with all the pressure, and you, you nailed it. He's like, that takes strength, and he's, like, really really proud of you. I was like, oh, like, thank you. I'm proud too. That was pretty, was really, really hard. Um, we should but talk. yeah, he was kind of nice. It, I don't know. I didn't have anything like horrible to say. And I like that the apprentice was all for charity. You know, I, I played for protect our winners and you can win almost a quarter million dollars. And even though I got fired, which I can sucked. I definitely didn't play my cards right there. <laughs> so he uh, gave you that you're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. Uh, you're fired. <laughs> he, um, you know, I told him, I'm like, I really, like, I really like the charity I'm playing for. Would you donate some money? He's like, sure. And even though he claims to like not believe in climate change, he donated ten grand to protect our winners, and I thought that was really cool. They ended up like getting the check, and they're like oh my God, like this is insane, Donald Trump. And then they kind of wanted to blow it out and like call him out on it. And like that didn't really feel good for me. They're like, let's like show that he's supporting a climate change and he publicly doesn't believe in it. And like to me, I'm like, I don't want to like call anyone out. Like there's enough people calling people out. And they just take the cash and go. I feel like he supported you though, not them. Mm, Yeah, maybe. Okay, I want to uh, change gears here because he did mention the fact that you, Sochi, first of all, jumps massive. Those were some jackers. Uh, you fell run one. You basically are the favorite to win, so you got all the pressure on your shoulders. Run two. Talk us through that. Oh, gosh. So many stressful moments in my life. Um, Sochi was a big one. I... Uh, 
My dad's like, he hates flying. He's very much like an earth guy. Uh, he flew all the way to Sochi. He's never been out of the country. Um, I had all my family there. It's definitely the favored to win. And when I fell on my first run, it just like the time between that first and second run, which we only had two at that point, it was like so daunting. It was the most pressure I ever felt. And as like I dropped more and more down as every rider went, I was in like last place, I think. And at that point, I wasn't on the U.S. team. I didn't really want to. I like represented the U.S., but I hadn't had a coach since I was 15. So I wasn't really connected to the team. I didn't have coach support. They were there, but I was just kind of like on my own. But one person who really helped me out was Ryan McDermott. <laughs> Wax tech homie um, and good friend. And he was there actually working for Canada, which was funny because he's in his whole Canada outfit and cameras are on me and I'm just like chatting with him. And he put um, his headphone in my ear and it was just this like really chill music. And he was like, you got this. And if you know Ryan, you know his demeanor. It's just like, he's like the kindest human I know. And he just like helped bring so much peace. And I remember right before I dropped in, I just kind of, I was so stressed and had so much pressure, but I just like sent a little prayer out to the universe and kind of thanked everyone who helped me get to that place in that moment. And it kind of like released all this like pressure I was feeling. And as soon as I dropped in, it was like instant flow state. I like a little bit fell off the rail early and then started to stress it, and then I just left it there. And then I went into, like, what felt like matrix mode. The jumps were so big, and I, like, I knew I was going to land everything before it even happened. It was such a cool experience. Like, everything slowed down, and I had so much, like, uh, calmness within me, but also, like, ambition and strength. And when I landed the last jump that I fell on the run before, I just, like, my heart exploded with joy. I was so happy. I like dropped to my knees in gratitude and just was like, I don't care if I won or not. I'm just so happy I landed that run and overcame all the BS that comes with it. And uh, I looked over and saw my family just like losing it. And it was like definitely a moment in my life I'll never forget. I haven't heard someone say that matrix mode. Yeah, that's special. You were like in, just in. You were like one with everything. You can see the landings as they're before they're happening, and, and they're just happening. And she did lace the rail section after that first rail, like laced. Everything. Keanu is just yeah, right there Keanu on the Reeves. Sidelines, just just hype. Keanu Reeves mode. Well, we happen to have a guest question from Mr. Ryan McDermott himself, Wax Tech Extraordinaire, legend of our sport. Here oh. we go. Hey, Jamie, it's Ryan. Hope this finds you all good. And uh, stoked you're getting a chance to sit down and spin it on with uh, Easton and Chris. Maybe you can uh, share the time uh, you won slow style at the uh, NZ Winter Games. And when uh, you were on the podium, you called out the head of the Winter Games <laughs> because of the discrepancy in the winnings between the women and men slope styles. That was... Uh, that was a classic Jamie moment, and uh, I think it definitely led to some changes as far as uh, what we see in the sport these days or the culture of snowboarding. So, um, yeah, and if that one's a bit dull, you can always uh, always tell the story about how you pinched that golf cart, cart from uh, the Sebastian at the first U.S. Open in Vail. That's a good one. That'll get some laughs. But, um, yeah, hope you guys are all good and much love. Take care. Oh, love that guy um to be honest I don't really remember the winter games <laughs> incident <laughs> but that sounds on par um you said there was a 15 grand difference or something between men and women's pay for first and you were basically saying that was bullshit as you got the award like, the I, sh I shouldn't even accept this award is what he's told me that's so badass. Gosh. <laughs> oh. That person sounds like, really badass. Whoever did that, that was great. <laughs> I really backed them. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I remember definitely always being an advocate for equality. Because when I started snowboarding, it was really far off. In the era where, like, you know, there were interviews interviewing the guys about 
just talking shit on women, like really bad stuff that nowadays would just not fly. Um, but yeah, I was probably just over it. Like, yeah, maybe there's not as many, but like we're still competing against the best. And even to be a woman in this sport takes so much extra strength and courage. Like, holy shit, those jumps. And we're made here to carry babies into this world, not really go do crazy tricks on icy jumps. But I love that. Yeah, I probably called them out. And maybe I had like a moment where all the cameras were on and it wasn't going to be hushed. So I was probably just like fired up and wanted to let them know what I was thinking. <laughs> um, I'm so thankful to see how far it's come. And I'm so proud of the girls that, I mean, they're doing tricks now. We, even myself last year, are doing tricks that men weren't even doing 10 years ago. You know, like when Aaron style first started happening, it was like sevens and nines and you know, we won't even talk about the men's big air at this time, but it's just unbelievable to see how far women's snowboarding has come and knowing that we definitely deserve equality. And there's still a lot of things that are, that are out of balance that I would love to see come full circle. And there's a lot of positive change happening, which is great, but it can, uh, there's still a lot more. What do you think specifically needs to happen? I think, um, I think like talking about it is huge, like talking about equality and like, I think it's a long time coming, like the suppress, the suppressing of women over the years. Like for instance, my mom in her day loved sports and she was really athletic and fit, but she wasn't allowed to do any sports. And my grandpa like didn't support her. She like really wanted to play football and he was like, no. And now he's like my biggest fan. He's 94 and he's like calling me out like, when are you going to do some new tricks? You've been doing the same run for quite a while <laughs> before. <laughs> I've evolved a little bit. But um, like that's crazy how much has changed in one generation. And I can't imagine what if I have a daughter, like what maybe she'll do in her lifetime, having a mom that helped pave the way for the next generations to come. But I think speaking about it and doing more initiative projects like what Woodward is doing right now with bringing in a women's ambassador team and like a panel to just discuss how can we incorporate more girls into action sports how can we um, help that balance and you know seeing more brands like GNU signing more girls and like helping helping build the sport up um, I would love to see all the brands do that, you know? It's usually, like, a team of 20 dudes and maybe, like, one or two girls. Like, why not have 10 and 10? Like, now there's definitely the girls out there that deserve the recognition and the support. Um, but, yeah, I'm still learning, too. Like, how can I play a role now, like, and give back more to the girls in this community and help build um, maybe more, like, women-focused events or just... Um, equal pay you know I'm sure there's still a lot of imbalance in that with certain brands but it's come a long way and I'm really happy to see it keep going well I just want to take this time to say thank you mm -hmm. for inspiring us all and I know especially a lot of young men and women looking up to you and I was kind of just thinking about somebody mentioned when I was doing my research that your first X Games you had a 180 in your run and now your run I watched your last year's X Games run, and it was front 10, back rodeo, cab 10, double. Fucking <laughs> think about that progression, right? No like, 180s in and, there. Huh? And you've, you've like, <laughs> it's just you, you've, you've evolved with the sport and pushed it and never, never been left in the dust. And I just kind of like, I just want to commend you for just always progressing and, and kind of want to pick your brain on how you have the drive to constantly progress for the past 15, 20 years on that rapid of a pace. Yeah. That to me is a trip first podium front one eighty on the money booter and last podium cab double 10, two tens in my run, which was a huge goal of mine. Happy I got that done before baby came to join me. <laughs> um, I'm actually working on a film right now. That's going to be out in the next couple weeks or so as soon as it gets all buttoned up but 
Um, it connects on a lot of my progression through X Games the last 15 plus years and kind of dives into uh, my backcountry and the Alaska segment that we filmed this year and last season. So it's a two year project, but gosh, there's a lot of evolution over X Games and it made me reflect on like so much, so many different generations of girls I competed with too, from like Tara Dakitas, who was like my idol as a kid, and Jana Mayan, and then into the phase of like Shirsty Buaz and Spencer O'Brien, and, and then any, like there's just been so many different, like probably three different generations of girls I've competed with that have like come in and gone out. And I have no idea how I kept the ball rolling. <laughs> I'm like still kind of trying to like dive into myself and understand my psych and like how I work and how I can share that with other people and how I can continue to progress in other areas of my life as I grow and evolve more. Um, but yeah, I think I think a big part of my success through that was, and this sounds kind of weird, but like not having a coach, I think helped me a lot because it it made it so much more fun. And I just decided to ride with the boys. And like Tyler was one of my main supporters of like helping me believe in myself with double corks and tens. Like I never had any desire to do those. And he was like, you've been doing front sevens for five years. Like you can do a front 10. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, no. And one day riding, like before we were even dating, just friends, he just pushed me to do it. And I tossed a front 10 and landed it like second try. And it still took me a lot of years to like work on that and bring it to um, like a slope style event. But it's crazy how like what we decide in our head is actually where we cap ourselves. And I just kind of capped myself and didn't even like think beyond that. And seeing other riders like Anna Gasser do a ton of airbag training and stuff and see her like do double corks and triple corks. Um, that also opened my eyes. I was like, Oh, maybe we are capable than more than I thought. And yeah, that just kind of helped me tap into myself. And like last year at X games, I was so hyped on that run and I barely pulled it together. It <laughs> took like the whole jam to do it. Um, yeah, it's a trip. I really am still trying to figure out how, but I think like slow, steady progress and trying to stay healthy, not just physically, but in your, in your psych and in your, your spirit, you know, I feel when my spirit is happy and I'm taking good care of that, like everything else kind of falls into place. And you were the girl that kind of uh, took out taquitas, huh? Those early contests, like you were the, you know, here she is, Jamie Anderson. Oh, yeah, I think so. It was like around that time when I think I got my first like bronze medal in slope style. The first year I competed in slope, I was 15. And I think I was on the podium with Jana Mayan and Jana, Hannah Beeman. That's so crazy. Yeah. Jana. And I don't mean take out. I just mean maybe gave her a threat, let's say. Like, yeah. Like here she is, you know. Yeah. And I think at that point, I'm not sure how old Tara was. Maybe 30. Maybe around the age I am now. And... uh yeah, and I know she had a lot of injuries and she was like kind of over it, but still like sending it. And then she went on to do some border cross stuff. And um, Jana actually kept writing for a couple years and she was like so fierce and intimidating and like not in a mean way, but like not very friendly. And I was kind of like this like, yee, super friendly, giddy, like, <laughs> ah, like just all who knows, just funny young Jamie. And, uh, yeah, she was strong-willed, but I remember she, like, gashed her knee at a dew tour, I think at, like, Snow something in, uh, where the... Snow Basin. Snow Basin. They had one here at Snow in Basin. In Utah. Yep. Yeah, and she, like, gashed her knee, and it was, like, all bloody, and she, like, taped it up with duct tape and dropped in and won. Oh. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, that was amazing, and I think that was the last event she won and then retired, and I knew she wanted to, like, end on top, and I was really inspired by her. I was, like, when it was, like, Jana, Spencer, and myself, and uh, lots of switchback fives at that time. It was, like, a back five, switchback five, front seven. Um, 
But yeah, there's been so much evolution. Such a so trip. So much. What's crazy too is Jana, like, I think she won the US Open at 13 and got that gold medal. And then goes has this long, awesome career. And here you are, all young, 15, 13. Doing the revolving that same. door. Yeah, the revolving door. Town. It's so amazing. Now, I have a hard hitting question for you. I'm curious about this. You've competed in the Olympics. Snowboarding. Is it an art form or is it a sport? Oh, I think snowboarding's an art form. It's becoming more what was the other thing you said? Sport? A sport or an art form? Um it's becoming more sport, but I think like the root of it is art. I love that coming from a especially from an coming Olympic. from her. Yeah. Totally. You would think sport. Yeah. Coming from an athlete at your caliber with gold medals and sport mode. But then you go to Alaska. And you have this awesome face. And and even, like, in slope style events, I always try to, like, even though they're pretty basic. And bring the art. Kind of, yeah, bring the art and, like, see how it feels, like, the flow of it. It's more, like, it's more than what meets the eye, you know? It's, like, how it looks top to bottom. And I think that was one thing I was pretty good at over the years was, like, finding my flow through it and trying to mm -hmm. imagine, like, how a river would like trickle down, like the most effortless route. And that's how I would think of like riding park. Like I would never visualize a run before I got there ever. And some people would be like, I'm working on this trick and that trick. And for me, it was like, I'm not sure how it's going to flow. Even X Games, like it's on the same run, but every year it has a little bit of a different flow. And my goal was to like make it look as effortless and like beautiful, not like, rigged or like trying too hard and I think that's where like the art plays a role even though of course you have to be athletic and it is like technically a sport but I think when you um, have a different way of looking at it you see it differently I love that they impress those judges she's look, right art form you know you gotta look a certain way th there's also a full-blown art to putting together the right slope style run when you show up to these events and it's really fun, like, at, you know, you show up day one, you know, on Tuesday, the event's on a Saturday or Sunday, and you watch all the riders get there and figure out their runs. They're all like, well, what should I do on this rail? What should I do on that? What should I do? Asking their coaches. And I like that it sounds to me, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but almost like the Craig Kelly approach, the be, be the ball, kind of do do what the course wants you to do, flow like flow like a river, like you said. Wise. Those are wise words. Very wise. And not having someone tell you what to do. Yeah, the coaching. That was, I think, my biggest um, blessing that I did to myself. Even though at times I was like, shit, like I should have a coach. Or I wanted to hire Danny Cass at one point and have him on tour with me. And I don't know, something, something about it. It just always kind of flowed better doing things on my own. And with the, there's always people around me, like Ryan, for yeah. instance, or Tyler and as I went back to the Olympics, I did start working with the team officially when I was 26. And um, I really enjoyed Mike Ramirez and Dave Reynolds. They're great coaches. Um, but later, you know, and more for like the psych. I think when you're young, you have so much like pureness to you. And as you get older, it's harder to be light. You have like, you know what's going to happen if you win another Olympics, you know, like the wealth it brings or the experiences that it's harder to be like, uh, I don't know what the word, like your innocence, like that's such a precious thing that you can't really take back, but you can carry the lessons forward. And, uh, yeah. And you also like get wisdom as you get older. So there's like pros and cons. I feel like my physical well being was a lot stronger in my thirties than it was in my early twenties. And I used to think 30 was old. And now I'm like, 30 is prime time, even 40s, you know? We can get better with age if we learn to, like, take care of ourselves. And the body's pretty incredible. All the injuries and concussions and broken teeth and cuts on my face. Like, I'm so thankful that when I take care of myself and go spend time in, like, hot springs and drink earth water and eat really good food, like, it's crazy how... You can radiate from the inside out. Earth water versus what other type of water? Uh, 
pipe water. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you know, right you want your water to circulate. I always try to drink spring natural water. Natural sources. Yeah. Even right I'd rather drink out source. of like a creek if I could. People are like, oh my God, there could be like a parasite, but I'd rather have like a nature thing than freaking chlorine and fluoride pumped in our water. It's kind of sad. Thankful for our water sources, but. Yeah, I try to keep it as natural as possible. Whatever you're doing is working, yeah, so I'm, working. I'm listening to whatever <laughs> you're working. talking about. Now, we got to talk about Korea because that one you won, uh, which was incredible. But the event was a bit of a train wreck as far as the wind, uh, the just the fact that of the hecticness of sending you guys off. Like they canceled, didn't they cancel like the ski racing, which is they don't even leave the ground. And then they ran women's slope style. So I just want to hear you elaborate about that event where it's it's beautiful that you won, but there's also some downsides of the fact that the FIS ran that thing in general. Oh, it was a complete nightmare, like gong show to the max. One of the many reasons why I think a lot of us don't like FIS and the IOC, like that was such a terrible decision to run us that day. And the problem with that event is <clears throat> the day before, it was also really windy, so they canceled qualifiers. So now instead of there being 10 women in the final, there was over 30 women in the final, and it was so hard to deliberate and like come to a common ground. And we had a tiny tent at the top, a heating tent, because it was so cold there, and it was so hard to be at the top of the course and everyone was stressing and the wind was horrible. Like the officials should have just made the call, you know, or they should have had like the coaches. There's just all this like knacking. And I remember feeling so stressed in there that I just like left. I was like taking laps outside to stay warm. I kind of knew that they were going to do whatever they wanted to do regardless. And my regret at that event was not standing up more and like connecting with the top girls the ones that are usually in finals and like saying, Hey, like, what do we want to do? I was kind of trying to protect my mental like stability and not get like my head all like razzled. Um, and I totally did not think they were going to run it, but they told us, and this is so crazy. They're like, if we don't run it today, we're going to cancel the event altogether. Oh, geez. And I was kind of like, what? Like, that's insane. And a little part of me was like, well, we better try to run it. So they said, we're going to do one practice run and reassess. So we did a practice run and it was so gnarly, like 50 mile an hour gusts. Jeez. Like I actually ate shit in that run. I overshot the jump. I was like crying at the bottom. I came back up. Tyler was there trying to kind of help support me. And I get to the top and I thought we're going to have a meeting and they're running the event and everyone was kind of just like, there's just no community communication. And I felt like a lot of the girls looked to me as like the leader of like, what do you think? And I kind of chose to stay out of it because the event organizers sucked. They weren't really listening. Like they should have known if they canceled Alpine, why would you not cancel Slope Style? So as they started the event and there's 30 women in the final, it was a complete just, it was terror on the mountain. Like you guys all saw, it was just so much carnage and so embarrassing for our sport that has already like evolved so much. And like, that was the event where I was saying like all the girls had worked so hard and like, I was so scared. I would, I didn't even know if I would podium if I couldn't land my double or nine or whatever I was doing at that time. And, uh, yeah, I dropped, like, towards the end, and every single girl before me d fell. And I was just like, oh, God, like, help me get through <laughs> this in one piece. And I had a pretty, like, mediocre run, like, not anything I was proud of. But I landed, and, like, that alone was a feat. Um, but as you watched it, it was just, like, such a low vibe. And, like, winning that event didn't even have the – essence of like celebration because there's just so much like negativity around the fact that they ran it and I felt like I took a lot of the backlash from like the industry and the girls that kind of like pointed the finger at me like like I had the power to run it or not run it which was really hard and 
I was pretty sad about that and just felt like, like maybe I didn't use my power the best that I could have. Maybe I should have said more or got involved and like stood up and, you know, I tried to do that this last winter at a really windy event. I was like, there's no way I'm riding. And all the girls outvoted me. <laughs> and they can't, like, they didn't even have, you can't win. I was so pissed. I was like, are you fucking You're like, kidding I'm trying me? to do the right thing here. I like, I'm like, all right, well, I can't change what happened in Korea, but moving forward, if we're ever in that sitch, I'm going to like stand up. And like, I got all pissed. I'm like, <laughs> all the coaches are raising their hands. They're like, yeah, run it. I'm like, why the fuck are you voting? Like, you're not writing. Like, get mm. out of here. And then all the girls outvoted me and I was so confused. I'm like, all right, like, God damn, I don't know what to do. Um, but yeah, that event was a heartache. Like, it was great to have been able to pull it together, but it didn't showcase like women snowboarding where it was at that time. And I think the only reason I was able to land a run and pull it together is because I did separate from like the politics of the tent at the top and all the chaos. But yeah, it was really mean. Like the girls were being pretty mean. And I went through the media line and they tore me apart. They're like, do you even deserve to have one? And this was like, they just were saying such hurtful things. And I like, I knew it sucked, but like, this is FIS. Like this, it wasn't a surprise to me because they do whatever they want whenever they want. And we all chose to be there and support the stupid Olympics. So what are we going to like cry that they didn't like, you know, like to me, it was kind of like pick and choose. Like this is why Terry and a lot of people like don't like the Olympics. Like they're not very wholesome. It's all money. It's broadcasting. It's the IOC. Like that shit is pretty Question, not good. Do you think they would have ran it if it was the dude's event? Yeah, the next day it was just as windy and they ran the dude's event. And, like, it wasn't ideal. Maybe it wasn't as windy, but, like, that course was windy the entire week. Mm -hmm. It's just a tough, it was a tough event. Yeah. I definitely and left that event, like, crying. Wow. And, like, not stoked. And back home, yeah, we were. We were seeing everyone fall. Well, that was the thing. Yeah, that was the thing. That's, it, was a, it was a travesty for snowboarding and women. Like the, the, it wasn't fair to the level of riding that mm -hmm. the bar had been set. It just it made snowboarding, it, just, it wasn't a good look. And, and unfortunately, that's, that sucks the way that happened. But I do want to rewind to Sochi because Barrett Christie gave me a little bit of some intel. She wanted to ask. She has another guest question. But before we hit that one, uh, she wanted to ask about the celebration after Sochi sounds like you turned up pretty good. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, tequila Louise was uh, in full swing <laughs> after that first Olympics. And, uh, Oh, what happened? Like I just remember day drinking and it was when the, the skier boys swept the podium for the U S and we just started drinking like mimosas in the morning. I was up, the Lulu Lemon House, and they were just like, we we're just drinking. And by the time it was nightfall, I ended up at the Team USA safe house. And gosh, I don't really remember what happened, but like the boss of the US team, like this older man, got me a shot of tequila. And apparently something happened, like I spanked his ass. Don't really remember. But then his wife like got mad and then someone else said I did a reach under, whatever that's called. What is a reach under? Reach around? I've heard of a reach around, reach but not a reach under. I don't know. <laughs> like it ended up really bad. Like I lost a deal with Visa that day. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> Oh, this, this is the oh. safe house. <laughs> Allegedly, oh. we should say. Allegedly, it Allegedly. sounds like you're not even sure what happened. I think what really happened is I had a lot of built up anger to the U.S. team because they never really supported me when I was young, and I needed the support financially probably more than anyone. And my sister Joan, who is a really good rider. She was never really taken care of, and it was always like Lindsay Jacob Ellis, Golden Girl, and Joan didn't really get any like support, and she was winning events, but still on the B team. So then, when I won a half pipe event in 2008, um, the team asked me to be on the rookie team, and I was like, eh, maybe, like I might come ride pipe a little bit. 
because I had um, my claim to fame in the pipe. I beat Kelly Clark at that one. And I was like, I just was, uh, sorry, little brain fog. It was just a lot. And the team offered me to be on the rookie team, which is no support. And then I never wanted to ride pipe. I would always be over in the park. So then they kicked me off the team. Wow. And I was like, whatever. Like, I don't care about the team. And this, I was like 17, 18. And I was just starting to like, I got sponsored by DVS and I was sponsored by a couple other brands that were supporting me and I had travel budget. So I was like, fuck the team. I don't need that. I just want to ride park and do X games. Like I have no desire to go to the Olympics. Like I didn't really care. I kind of tried that next season because it was the Vancouver games in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, they're like, you should try it. So like I went to a couple of qualifiers. I didn't do so well. Then a few years later, when the team approached me, I was like, no, like, I don't want to be on the team. Who like, are you when I adios. need you, right? Like, so it was kind of a big deal. They, like, signed, like, Chaz Goldman and, like, all Eric Willette. And I can barely even remember who was all on the team, my first one. But And they didn't sign me. And everyone's like, how come Jamie's not on the team? But it was because I didn't feel the love and support. And so at that Olympics, after I won gold – I kind of chewed them apart really drunk, and it probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Long story short, lost a visa deal. <laughs> lost a visa yeah, deal. So I did a I, reach, reach under. <laughs> yeah, a reach around or something. I don't know. And that didn't even happen. That was just a rumor. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly for legal purposes. Oh, I was oh, so sad. Yeah, that was a big deal. Good hey, stuff. It happens. You know, it's worth respect, though. You know, you know what? I got a quote on here that's from... Uh, from Pat Bridges, which is maybe one of the best quotes ever. Uh, and it's in, in air quotes, more Sean Palmer than Sean White will ever be <laughs> Pat Bridges. <laughs> and that speaks to it right there. <laughs> That's why you're goaded, Jamie. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> off of Visa. Oh, yes. gosh. We love it. Thank you for doing what you do. Yes. Aww. Yep. I appreciate that. He also, when I was talking to him, he said... Uh, he had some good stuff to say. He said she would uh, hit jumps all day and then get jumped at Lakanuki. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely happened at one super park. <laughs> wow. I think he also quoted in that interview. I, I quoted actually myself. I can't expect to talk shit and not get my ass kicked. <laughs> and that definitely happened. Damn, the Palmer's coming through. Lock and nucky. The Palmer Ooh. runs deep with this one, bud. Yes, real deep. We are going to take a second to uh, hear from the good folks at Volcom about their fits. And I get a little confused about fits and shits, and uh, this is talking about clothing, I think. So let's hear what they have to say. Bonjour, Van Paul. Uh, we're going to talk some fit. Arthur Longo here. I'm introducing you my uh, collection. For me, when it comes to the feet, I wanted something kind of close to the body, but not too much. A little, uh, a little baggy enough to have layers underneath, and you know, to have like a nice little silhouette. So, you know, I can cinch it, and it's. Uh, I would say it looks like a little bit like squarey, boxy, maybe a bit baggy, but not too much, and that does the job perfectly for me. And I hope it will uh, for you too. And so that's it. Let's tread. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about Hippie's Organic Chickpea Puffs, Stony Buds. Yeah, I think we're talking about Sriracha Sunshine today, and wow, delicious. Uh, it's almost unsafe the amount of bags I've been putting down of these things. They are uh, they taste like something that would be unhealthy for you because they're so good, but they're actually good for you, buds. Yeah, and you know, it's like secure the bag is what they always say. <clears throat> they're kosher, they're vegan, plant-based protein, delicious. They're non-GMO as well. Uh, one thing I think we should talk about, too, is the fact that they support the bomb hole. And it's incredible because uh, I support eating them, so it goes hand in hand. So if you want to go check out some hippies, head on over to hippies.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE20 for 20% off. They're also available at your local grocery store. All right, we're going to get into a guest question from none other than one of the greats of our sport of our culture, of our art form, whatever you want to call it. Barrett Christie. 
Jamie, I'm so glad you're sitting down at the bomb hall. I can't wait to hear some stories from you. Uh, I've got a question. Um, so one thing I regret a lot from working with you over the years is that I didn't go to the Olympics in Sochi. And, you know, for all the reasons that a lot of people don't go to Sochi, but I didn't make it. And that was the year you and Caitlin won gold medals. And, you know, I would have liked to be there for the celebration afterwards. I'm sure it was a good time. But I'm wondering if you could tell the story about how that went. What was it like after winning your first Olympic gold medal? Can't wait to hear the answer. Bye. <laughs> oh, Barrett. I love her. She's I'm so thankful she's in my life. Such a good friend, mentor, and TM. Uh, don't worry, though, Barrett. You didn't miss much in Sochi. <laughs> you might have missed me losing a couple uh, big contract deals with Visa and stuff. <laughs> Maybe you would have helped me stay out of trouble, actually. I needed a good mentor at that phase in my life. Um, but, wow, celebrating was, from what I can remember, it was really fun. I was really happy to celebrate with my family. Um, I can like, gosh, my memory is so fried. I can't really remember everything. But I remember just so much relief and so much gratitude. Um, waking up with that beautiful gold medal. I was like, I was tripping for a couple days. And we had a really good celebration. I definitely remember partying with Caitlin. She's like a really fun party friend. And yeah, that was pretty surreal. Two GNU athletes take the cake. Um, gosh, good old moments. Now I got a question too. Uh, what do you do with your medals? Like, where are these things? Not, not that, or maybe not. Especially I'm not trying to steal many. them, but like, <laughs> like I mean, I'd be wearing them around. Buds yeah, would be running. I'd be it. wearing all of them. Yeah. All twenty one. I should have brought one for you guys. Could have stayed here for a little while. <laughs> Put it on the wall. You'd forget it and it would still be here. And you'd be like, where is that thing? Um, I feel like I'm very humble. Like, I don't really have, like, a trophy wall. Or I have, like, a lot of my trophies in my garage in Tahoe, like, old ones. A lot of, like, due to her events and such. Um, I have all my X Games medals and Olympic medals up in Canada. Tyler built me like this really beautiful snowboard rack um, with a signature board that said, do what you love. And then he hung all my medals under, but it was like too much for me in one place. I had it up for like a year or two, but I don't know. I just like, I think when I'm still in the game and still in like sport mode, I don't really want to like put everything on a pedestal. I kind of want to like keep it going. Uh, so honestly, my medals are kind of stashed. They're actually right now in like a bag because I brought them to a shoot to shoot some. But uh, I need to create something. I was thinking about taking the lanyards and the chains off and having them all on like picture frames, maybe with like photo memories. Um, the Olympic medals are really nice. Like you can tell they're super solid and like have a lot more um, weight to them. And one's in my bathroom on a shelf, and the other two are sadly in that bag, kind of stashed away right now. Secure <laughs> the bag. Yeah, Ty Tyler told me he was cleaning out a room in like when when you guys first started dating, and there was like you just opened up some like purse, and there was just like five or six X Games medals in there that you'd like forgotten about. <laughs> I know he's so cute. He's the one who's like, you need to hang these up. Like you need to put them on the wall. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I well, don't know. We, we <laughs> I think years from now you'll be pretty yeah. happy. Years yeah, I would up. love to. I need. A, I live in like a small space, and I want to move into a bigger home and like have like. I don't know. I do want to like celebrate myself more and be proud of everything yeah. I've done. I think it's just been such fast-paced living the last 10-plus years that I haven't really had time to barely even decorate my house. Mm. I pretty much just have, like, plants in my house and a couple art pieces. But I want to, like, print old photos and, like, I don't know, I want to do more. Maybe while I have a little one, I'll have a little bit more time to, like, nest and get cozy. 
Now, I have another question. This is from Barrett. She had two questions she sent over. The other one I didn't put into the podcast machine here. But she also asked, what's your why? Why do you do it? What's your why? I would say my why is because I love it. All of it. I love snowboarding for one. And I love the... uh, I love creating projects. Like I want to do more film projects in the future. I have a film coming out soon, which I'm really excited to share. Um, But the contest stuff, I even love that. I love tapping into like the power of the mind and like perseverance and like finding my flow state. And yeah, I really love it. That's the only reason I do it. If I wasn't having fun, I think I would have stopped a long time ago. All right, we got another guest question. This one's from MFR, a true champion. What? I also want to like basically say sorry to Leanne and Hannah and MFR because they all ask the same question, uh, basically. So this is like... MFR won the lottery on that one? Yeah, we're going to go with MFR because they're, they're all basically the same question. So, But God, respect to all those beautiful humans. Here we go. Hi, Jamie. This is Marie. So stoked to hear what you have to say on the bomb hole. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you something about kind of your mental game. Um, Way back then, I remember it was one of the men's super park and I was riding and I had heard that the day before some girl came up to you in the bathroom and said an insult to you. And I don't know what it was, but I just heard that you punched her right in the face. And I thought that was, damn, that's so badass, Jamie. And um, I've also, we've all been watching you win pretty much every contest for the last two decades. And I know that you're a really Zen person and really into spirituality and calmness and breathing. So I'm really curious, how do you go from being so connected and, and Zen and then how do you transfer to full beast mode and winning every contest that you put your mind into. Like, is there a switch? Like when you're on top of a course and you're stressed out, like at the Olympics, what is your mental game? I would love to know. Love you. Bye. Love Marie. Um, Oh, wow. That kind of threw my Zen under the bus (laughs) with the knockout at the bar. (laughs) But what can I say? I was actually kind of crazy when I was younger. I found my zen as I got older. Um, I think growing up in a big family, I was always really tough. And I, we, my sisters are like my best friends and we all had each other's backs. And growing up, we fought a lot because that's what siblings do. So I think as I was like, Growing into myself, like, I wouldn't really take anything. Like, if people were giving me shit, like, I wasn't really afraid to fight. I'm not proud of that, and I've grown a lot since then. But, yeah, there are definitely some moments where I held my ground and would definitely get in a couple bar fights here or there. Lock a anywhere. <laughs> we talking, like, fights? Uh, yeah, like, fights. Like scraps, drunken fights. <laughs> Scrappy. Yeah. Um, Tyler will give you guys some good, <laughs> good stories on that too, I'm sure. But um, what I think changed for me and what helped me become more loving and kind was like a near-death experience I had when I was 17. And I was just starting to accumulate a ton of like money and sponsors and I don't know, awards and such. And I had a freak accident caught my toe edge at the U S open in Vermont and ruptured my spleen. And I was in like really critical condition and ICU. Leanne Pelosi was actually there with me. She like rode in the ambulance to the hospital and, um, I was really scared. I've never been so hurt. Like I was in bed for five days and couldn't walk. And I think I ended up in the ICU for like close to two weeks and, I remember getting a lot of love from the snow community and flowers and nice cards. And when I healed from that injury, I just had a real deep appreciation for life and my well-being and my physical health. And that's when I learned about 
Chinese medicine and that like your spleen is actually really vital and one of the most important organs for your immunity, filters all your blood and helps you stay healthy. Um, and in Western medicine, you know, they often are like, oh, we'll just remove it. In my case, I was really lucky they didn't do a surgery. They let my body heal on my own. And even though a lot of it was damaged, it still does its job, which another shout out to the human body. Incredible. But through that, I learned of like, yeah, Chinese medicine, using herbs, eating better food. I got into yoga. I got more into like gratitude. I started being a lot nicer to the people around me and not picking fights, not like having that like hostile energy in me. And that's, I think, <clears throat> at a time where my career started to like really rise because I think the frequency inside of me was more like loving and kind and abundant. It wasn't like trying to prove myself or trying to like punch someone out if they said something wrong to me. Like I can barely believe I did that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like through what we talked about earlier, like when hard things happen, like you can either be sad about it or you can learn and grow from it. And that experience I really grew from. And I think it brought a lot of goodness to my life. And, you know, I was a lot more preventative to injuries. And I learned to kind of play with my heart rate and my nervous system. And when I was really stressed and nervous, like at the top of an Olympic course, I could like channel that energy and like relocate it or like take certain types of breaths or walk over to the forest and take a moment with a big tree and just like ground myself and scientifically like grounding yourself being in the forest being in nature like that stuff isn't just like hippity dippity do like that stuff really does help you feel better and those are kind of some of the tools I've used over the years to try to be more zen and I think it's helped my performance and I know X Games kind of tried to make fun of me and call me like the tree hugger and I was like who doesn't love trees like you know they're trying to like make fun of it but it was actually I don't know how can we not appreciate our resources clean water the forest the mountains like that's where people retreat to for serenity for peace especially people that live in cities and don't have that opportunity to be around nature. So Marie, you sweet legend. I know you love all this stuff too, because you built your cob house out of earth elements, but I think that's it. Going back to nature, calming down, flipping that switch from stress to like rest, <laughs> restore. <laughs> that's the key. Yeah. I can't even imagine her punching somebody out. <laughs> Don't ask Pat Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> Did you punch him out? Close. No. <laughs> Said no, Pat, but he Pat was... at Super Park, give him a black eye. No, he, Pat he the just black eye Bridges. it. Yeah. 17 year old Jamie was a lot different. He probably loved it. Well, we're getting some good nuggets. Yeah. I'm, le I'm like learning here. Like, <laughs> okay, so like spirituality, getting grounded, being peaceful. That's how you, that's how you lace the run. You know, I like it. It makes sense. Okay, not that it's not that difficult. Not no, that, not that difficult. Piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just do front ten, back rodeos, cab ten, double. So and then you're good to go. And music, music, music. is a clutch. I don't think I would have probably laced any runs without some. What you listen to at the top? hip hop in yeah. my ears. Gangster we, specifically, what yeah. are you listening to at the top? Oh well, it changes a lot, but lots of old like '90s hip hop. '90s hip hop. Biggie, Wu Tang Clan. Tupac, Biggie, um, classics. Zion I sometimes a little bit of like chiller vibes. Um, what else? Uh, some new school music. Like I was bumping Drake for a couple seasons, and I don't know, kind of whatever feels good in the moment. I list. I like repeat music a lot. I'd like listen to one playlist all season. And just like have like one song I would ride with <laughs> at every event. When you're at an event, it's, it's yeah, a, it was kind of like song, let's got go. me on that wavelength. I think it was like Gunner lap two seasons ago. Like I really liked Sick. that album, Money uh, on My the Money song. Yeah, he's dope. <laughs> but Money's up. a good motivation. Talking music, you know what I think it might be time for? Name that video part.
Name That Video Part is presented by Woodward. Now, Woodward Park City is about 15 minutes from Salt Lake, two miles past Parley Summit. They're open 365 days a year with twilight lift access for skiing and snowboarding. And for this winter, Woodward Park City added 20% more terrain park features, Stony Buds. Yeah, Woodward Park City is Utah's ultimate training facility with trampolines, foam pits, airbags, with the best coaching staff in the biz, all designed for progression. It's also one of Salt Lake City's only indoor heated concrete skate park, which is very important in these uh, cold winter days. Love that we can skate year-round up there. Drop in for a session or a lesson any day of the week, Buds. Access to Woodward Park City is available through daily tickets with full day lift access starting at $40. Just a good place to have fun with your friends, simple as that. I know Jamie's doing some cool stuff with Woodward currently. Uh, they they always got cool stuff going on. They we did really an event do. up at Woodward. We did dogfight up there. E- equal money, Jamie. Mm-hmm. Equal prize money. If and you're interested in a rail jam next uh, winter, we got you. Equality. <laughs> Let's if go. you want to enter, you know, there's, we'll, we'll see if maybe we can get you on there. Should we need to Thank raise the you. prize money if we get Jamie yeah, we get there. She's like, this, this, is, this is peanuts. We don't Jamie. want her calling us out. Yeah. Well, just in general, like she doesn't show up for yeah. that kind of, those little, I mean, little what, chicken scraps 40, for Jamie. 40 grand to do some financial <laughs> stuff at, at the uh, at Park City or wherever Beaver you were. Creek. Beaver Creek. <laughs> All right. Name that video part. How's your confidence level, Jamie? Um, not very good. <laughs> She's honest. <laughs> yeah, we'll see though. Zero through ten. You got to give us a number. Um, probably like, oh gosh, like five. Okay. I mean, no, that's, that's like, I mean, like half. I mean, I know some videos. Just kind of live seen under some a rock. Videos. A lot of the time, like this year, I haven't been that good. All right. Well, let's see how you do. El boogie. I love that song. I Good can't song. even believe somebody used that. Yeah. I, if I had to guess, because I don't know, maybe a Tech Nine video. <laughs> you know no, what? No. This is it. This is a monumental <laughs> moment in name that video part. Is it? Why is it hers? It's Jamie's own video <laughs> part. <laughs> he's been waiting. Why? Dude, he's been waiting to have this. But happen. how did this I is- use that? <laughs> She's like, I can't even believe someone used that song. Yeah, I'm trying to think. If who, I wrote, re- okay, do that? you know what? I fucking did. Okay, I did. But I. <laughs> who used who that? Who used that song? Okay, I used the Nas song, but like, how did I get away with that? I'm trying to think about who the editor was and if that was even legal. <laughs> You know how much respect yeah, we have for that? That's, that's a true winner when you don't know your own video that is, part. That is awesome. You won, you won this, prize, this okay. prize pack. What was the video? Um, full moon. Full moon. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, actually, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I I'm think kinda, so. Yeah. Thank you. This looks sick. <laughs> yeah, you how do I, hole stuff I'm there. like so embarrassed. That's bad. I'm proud of you, actually. I just love how I'm you said who would I do that. I really <laughs> love that song, and I was thinking Great for song. a second, it like kind of brought me back. I'm like, who would use that? Like, That's a really good song. <laughs> we've always... Wa- let me tell you something, Jamie. We've all we've gave a couple people their own video parts. We've always wanted them to not get it. Yeah, he's been just waiting and for they this get moment. it. And they and like the fact that you didn't get your own video part puts you into like <laughs> immortal yeah. legend status. That's, like, I guess I don't watch my awesome. own video <laughs> enough. So you won yourself a bomb Thank hole prize you. pack. It's a Yeti bag filled with bomb hole goods. We got beanies. We got uh, smelling salts, stickers. Uh, we got hoodies. All kinds of good stuff. Also. I'm pretty sure these are organic too. Smelling oh, salts. I'm no, I'm scared of that. You could give it a light whiff because I know you know. We'll do. We'll do one after name that video part. I uh, don't even. I can't do that. I'm like ashamed of myself. No, I'm proud that. of you. I'm proud of you. Straight up. Like, but it's like I don't like watching myself. That's why I never really flash back on like. I don't know, even like not having the medals on the wall or not like I'll watch my video like once because I just critique it. So it kind of makes sense that I don't remember that song. Yeah. It speaks to your humi- humility. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually a really endearing trait. Who, who used that song? <laughs> Tech Nine? <laughs> yeah. Like what? Chris Bradshaw? <laughs> This is great. Oh my so gosh. legendary. <laughs> Jamieism. All right. In the flesh. Na- uh, name that video part part two is for our listeners. Uh, if you know the song, comment on the photo of Jamie on her Instagram when her episode comes out. That's where we pick our winner. 
so uh, this is a great uh, woman's film to provide a little crumble of a hint, I guess. But a hint. Okay, here we go. Something deep down in my soul. Mm, that's a good song. No real confidence in where it's from, but because you said a woman's project, I know it's, I don't feel like it's one of the films that Leanne did. I'm kind of feeling uninvited too. It's, I don't think it's in that. I can't confirm or deny, but it's not. Okay. But no. The thing that's great about this is that this one's for the listeners, yeah, so you don't, you don't need to know this. You're, okay. You're off the hook. Okay. You're off the hook. Off the hook. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you guys for playing Name That Video Part. Sorry, I hope I didn't interrupt that. No. My own video part. <laughs> Legendary. Wonderful. All right, let's do a small insult, buds. Let's do it. So, so what are you going to do? You have to open it? You just squeeze it. I'll start it off because I don't want you to go in too hot. I'll, I'll give you a tutorial. Buds, here you go. I'll hand this thing. We only have two. So Bud's going to do one. This is this is all you do. So I'll squeeze it. Okay, now it's now it's smelling. <coughs> oh, my God. <coughs> you just give it a little give it a little whip. Just go easy, though. You know, we don't we don't know if it's organic or not. Just go real easy till you get some. <laughs> She, she went back for more. Oh, it hurts. It burns your nose. <laughs> okay, ah, good. That's terrible. Woo! I got oh. a good one. I got a good one. Yeah. Is it supposed to tingle your yeah. nose? Yeah. Yep. It's Is supposed it to good wake for you, you up. at all? It wakes it's supposed you to up. wake you up. It yeah, actually it did. releases more did. blood. Respiratory system. We're mm-hmm. ready to go for the second Capillaries. half. Capillaries. I think Babe just did a little dance in here. Yeah. Ready to go for another six hours. Woke the baby up too. We're ready to go. <laughs> We got a little extra kick right there. We got another 12 hours in us now. He's got back. All right. Uh, Buds, let's fire off some Patreon questions. Let's do it. You uh, know? For the people that don't know, Patreon is uh, they're the supporters of the show, along with our sponsors and, and those of you who purchase merch. That's how we're able to do this podcast. So we really appreciate our Patreon members. You can sign up for as little as five dollars a month. I sound like I'm doing a, a infomercial. Let's let's keep it rolling. As little as five <laughs> to fifty dollars a month, you can sign up to Patreon and support us. And uh, you get to ask a question like someone that Buds is going to select right yeah, now. You know, we've had a lot of talk about just you know your mental and what goes on. So this is a mental health question from Bradley Craig. Your efforts supporting camps and wellness programs on top of your professional career, are inspirational. Recently, rediscovering snowboarding is the best thing that's ever happened to my mental and emotional health. What are some ways that people like me can help foster the future of snowboarding and improve access for others to enjoy it? Oh, great question. And I'm happy to hear it's inspired you and made you feel more joy. Um, Yesterday firsthand, I saw like those young girls that don't, get to shred a ton just how much joy it brought like their vibe in the morning pretty like inward and shy and kind of on their phones a lot to after the session you could just see their spirit like their eyes were so bright and they're so happy and running around and you can see that it brings a lot of like good energy um one thing you can do is share that love with your friends and family and if you want to connect with some foundations. I know my foundation is focused on helping engage young kids with sports. You can make a donation on my website, Jamie Anderson Snow, and learn more about some of the activations me and my team are doing. Uh, We're raising funds now to help send young girls to nationals. Uh, Woodward made a donation yesterday of five grand, which is huge. I firsthand know how hard it was as a kid to like get to those amateur events and it's a lot of pressure on the parents who work a lot so um we do some like silent auctions and i can send out posters for donations as well and that's one thing you can do but there's so many foundations i'm sure if you look some up there's a lot of local ones you could support and uh yeah thank you for your support that's really sweet good stuff uh, okay, I want to talk about your X Games medals because we got 21, I believe. Is that right? I think so. That's great. And and you also, there was no big air for the women. 
so you didn't have as many opportunities. You're, you're tied with Sparky, Mark McMorris, mm. but you're the most winningest slope style rider in the history of snowboarding. Um, yeah, even out of Sparky too. Well, Sparky had more big air. Yeah, he beat more slope style. So as far as slope style, as far as slope style, Woo. most winningest. If my if my research is correct, I'm think, sure it is. You're I think it is. pretty astute about this stuff. Yeah, studious. We're pretty studious. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I didn't even know that. Had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> she just stacks them up. It doesn't look back, you know. <laughs> Who me? She, she's got a bag in her garage. My, my own just <laughs> How many medals do I have the most? What? That person that called that them out at the New Zealand Open sounds like a real cool person. <laughs> I'd like Gosh, to meet her. Who am I? <laughs> Gosh, that's funny. Yeah, I am. I'm a. I'm blown away at myself. <laughs> I don't know about the X Games medals. I don't know how that all happened. I think. Uh, Flow State has been engaged for about 15 years and hopefully continuing on. But, uh, yeah, I wish we got to do Big Air. I'd maybe have 30 or more medals at this point. But uh, I'm thankful it's now happening. You see such a crazy progression. I actually don't really love Big Air. But it is cool to have a perfect jump to try to perfect, like, your bigger tricks you're working on. I've always preferred slope style and having more like flow top to bottom and feeling like I'm actually snowboarding. Um, but yeah, 21 medals. I don't know. That's insane. Especially as we were reflecting earlier on my first one with a front 180 and just how much it's grown. It's crazy. I wish, uh, yeah, hopefully I'm not sure if I'll want to do more or not, but even just as hi, little love, for the um, listeners, Phil the dog just came in the studio. Smelling the babe, coming over to send his love. Coming over to eat some garbage, really, is what he's coming um, over to do. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's been it's been quite the ride. It's really fun. It's more fun now than ever because there's so much competition, and I have to work really, really hard. So when I land a run, I'm, like, way more proud of myself than ever before. Now, with with where it's at right now, it's it's such such a fun event to watch. With Zoe and Tess and Annika and all these women that are just fucking destroying. Uh, where do you feel like we're at currently and where we're heading with, with snowboarding and maybe particularly women's snowboarding? I feel we're in a really powerful place with women's snowboarding. It's been such an honor to compete with all these girls. Um, big fan of Zoe. I think she's kind of the driving force behind... Uh, the progression right now and you can tell in her snowboarding she's like she's just a really good snowboarder we've all seen it like natty select and different events that she just charges and she has good style and she's really like calm and nice like i really respect her not just as a snowboarder but as a woman and holy smokes like those switchback 12s i'm kind of like there's any perfect time to get pregnant. It's like right now. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be watching um, this year as an observer. I haven't really done that in many years. I've been so in the mix that I, I've barely ever taken a moment to step out and kind of look from a different angle. Um, some injuries over the years, but I've been like relatively healthy. Um, but yeah, I think it's going in a really good direction. Uh, kind of. I I like all the progression, but I also want to see more creativity. I want to see like the events create more dynamic, different park setups. You know, I loved seeing Peace Park last year with like the half park course. Like that to me is really fun and um, a better way of progression. And like X Games when they've added the quarter pipe hits and like just more creative features where it doesn't have to be like three big jumps in a row with your biggest tricks. Like I like to see four jumps so it can showcase all the different ways of spinning, even like your weaker ways. And also like, I'd love to see like butter pads and creative features that maybe bring that level down, but expand in like a more artsy, like fun to watch way. Mm -hmm. The girls, I'm sure the girls are like, right. I think we're going to be seeing like a lot of triple corks this year and 1440s. 
which is like incredible, but it's not exactly where I, I want to see like my snowboarding go. I think I said that before, but like, I think tens are kind of my max. Like I could kind of visualize a cab 12 or maybe, um, maybe, I don't even know. <laughs> it's hmm. kind of crazy, but yeah, it's definitely, it's insane where it's going. I'll tell you what, I love watching it. And Chris says, you know, he's up there jumping around, at, yelling at the TV, and I don't do that with men's. No. It's like the same grab, this crazy spin, and with women, you're just invested in this program and the people and, and exciting. It's it's such a great time for women's snowboarding. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people say they enjoy watching the women's events much more now. I do, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's gotten a little hectic in the guy's zone. It's hard. Like, I, I'm a snowboarder, and I can't keep track of the spins. Yeah. I literally can't. Last year at X, we were drinking and watching the men's final big air uh, up at the Monster Suite. And I remember I got like nauseous. Trying and, to count them? Yeah, literally. I like had or to I go. I thought out she was and, talking about from the style. Yeah. No, <laughs> just from the swirly bird. It was just too much. Too and much. it's kind of sad because like they don't, I mean, it's still so incredible. And all those guys, like, I don't want to take away from their progression, but it's just like, where does it end? Like we're doing way more than aerialistic. Is that what it's called? Aerial skiing, aerial whatever. Skiing, yeah. Like we're doing way more than that, which is like, I don't know if we like take a step back and zoom in, like, what do we want to see? Like if the, the hands of our, how do I say this? If the future of our sport is in our hands, like how can we navigate some changes but everyone's so sucked in that it's like airbag training, trampoline, repetition, and it's just kind of dull. So I don't know. I, I think some things are going to shift in the years to come. As far as activating that, you know, I've talked about this on, on air before, so excuse me if I'm repeating myself. Uh, but I, you know, I feel like, you know, in one aspect, people are like, you shouldn't put constraints on it, but they're just rewarding higher spins. They don't reward really the grabs that much or the the progression in other rotations or axes. So, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a way to solve this would be requiring like one of the jumps to be under nine hundred, um, where it's it's cool. Or maybe even you can even do ten eighties on those jumps that are chill looking. But uh, what do you think about let's just say uh, a slope style run? One of the jumps is mandatory. It's a big jump, but it's mandatory, like under 1080, where you have to mix up your axis and your grab. It's like a style feature. Do you think that that's heading in the right direction, or do you think that's bad putting constraints on it? Oh, I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. I think it's tough to do that, but I think one way they could do that is what they've kind of dabbled with is like changing the courses. And making it like not feasible to do a triple cork on a certain type of jump. And it gets kind of weird when you try to control the people, I think. But like I would like to see that, you know. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how to navigate. Like it's all so crazy. And it's kind of like a reflection of our life. Like sometimes things just happen so quick. And like social media and just how quick things happen and evolve that like you barely have time to like slow down and like take a moment and like see where you're at and where you want to be going like trajectory wise. But I, I feel like it would be more beneficial for the event organizers and like the committees to know that like this shit's getting a little out of control. Like how can we, with the power of designing courses, like change this trajectory to more like more creative, more stylish, more fun to watch and I think that would be something that would help uh, the future of the sport. You know, there are a couple of those those Japanese and Chinese guys. They look good on doing some of those moves. Yeah, some of them actually yeah. tweak. <laughs> so their right. arms are like yeah. perfect, and they're so insane. those those guys are so good that it's like, who knows where they're gonna go? Totally. What, what if at these competitions, soap style, they like did an exact replica of like Chad's gap into pyramid? And uh, that'll slow the speeds, the spins down. You know what I mean? Like, 
<laughs> if the consequences were so high. Just put a giant mining tail landing. Maybe like an alligator pit. Like yes. no one's coming up short. Just yeah. some I don't alligator know. pits. I like that. But yeah. it's good. Angle. It could change everything. <laughs> but talking about contests, the anti-contest, uh, <coughs> kind of in a way, Peace Park. You mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. You've uh, haven't you won pretty much every one of those, or you've pretty much dominated those things, right? Oh my! I uh... she has no idea. I don't know. <laughs> 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 um, I've won two, and I yeah, I think I did win all of them <laughs> because there's a COVID hiatus. Yes. Um, yeah, I won the first one in Tahoe. I think it was like 2019 at the Woodward over at Boreal, which was so fun. Shout out to Danny Davis, um, helping guide the direction in a fun way. Um, and then yeah, this last year we got to go to Mount Bachelor, and. I won the overall, but I think Elena won, like, the highest air on a hip, and somebody else won the slalom. I won the park style, and I think the highest hand plant, or, sorry, the half park. Um, But, yeah, those events are so fun. Like, that's the things that, for me, like, light my heart on fire and make me excited about snowboarding, especially after so many years of repetition. Like, I want to help even create a women's event that's, like, creative and different and embodies that like uh creative progression not just so mechanically done for real that event was awesome now he is awesome another spark is sick what about uh your experience doing natural selection as far as talking about a different event all powder course um how was it competing in natural selection um Natural selection was such an honor. Holy smokes. I was really, really excited. I'm sad I've only gotten to do one and it didn't go so well for me. I think I was a little excited and kind of went a little bit too ham, but I love that event. I've been really excited to watch that the last couple seasons. I think that's a really sick direction for snowboarding to go. I can, I can just like see how stoked everyone was like even all the like surfers coming out to Jackson Hole that first year like people want to see that type of snowboarding and there's really nothing like it I mean you have like the big mountain tour or what's it called uh, uh something free else. ride world free tour. ride yes, world, free ride tour. world tour but that's so different than what like Natty Select brings um I would love to get a chance to go back there I don't want to redeem myself. I'd love to make it to Alaska. Um, yeah, I'm so hyped on Travis. What a freaking legend to help create that. So talking about, you know, we've, we haven't talked at all about your video parts because you've filmed in Alaska with Full Moon and it sounds like your last latest project that's probably out by the time this podcast is out. Uh, where do you see the future of your snowboarding going? I would love to ride more big mountain for sure. I want to do more film projects, not just focused on snowboarding, but also focused on cultural zones around the world, like places I really want to go. I'd love to visit the Himalayas for the beautiful mountains and exploring, but also the culture and the spirituality there and the food. And I think it'd be really cool to like share those experiences with maybe people that aren't able to like I want to use this platform and everything I've kind of worked for in the past to like help take my life in like a cool fun creative direction especially like family life Ty and I have talked about next year uh, driving up to Alaska and spending a couple months there and getting to enjoy like the end of winter but also enjoy like the beginning of spring and just all the beautiful nature out there and I want to spend a little bit more time at the ocean, surfing and being in warm water. But yeah, for snowboarding, I definitely want to do more more filming. I'd love to ride more lines in AK. I'd love to incorporate a bit more like freestyle riding there. Into those lines. That's what we need sure. to see. Yeah. We need to see you go birthday ball, natty front seven. Yeah. We need to get you going. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I I would love that. Put down a slope style run in in, in birthday bowl. Yeah, go cab five a spines. finger, wingle a couple turns, launch a front seven, whack a toe side. That's what we need. That's what we need so to see. Fun. That's what the people want. 
How was that transition for you, jumping into those kind of lines? And was it scary and all that? Oh, yeah. I was pretty... I've gotten to do a handful of trips to Alaska, but um, gosh, it's still so intimidating. Very scary. I don't have like a ton of experience with um, big mountain riding and like convex rolls and just like um, all of it. Like it was so cool this year to go with Elena because she has like been just absolutely sending it and she has so much more experience. And it was really nice to have someone. Um, with her expertise around just with like snow management and how to like actually crank good turns and like stay in front of your slough. And like, I was so impressed with her riding and I'm so proud of her for this, uh, everything she's done. I'm out there and I'm like, just like barely trying to hold it together. (laughs) And I felt like we made a really good team. I'd love to do more projects with her, especially she's goofy and I'm regular. So it was so, easy with like line choice like there's only really a couple times we had to Rochambeau for like certain runs but it was like really effortless and she was in just good spirits and confident and also like not too um I don't know really calm and humble like I really love Elena's energy and I'm excited to share with you guys some of the stuff we got to do and she uh well she kind of shares the info with you when you're up there like Oh, for sure. Mentor almost, a yeah. AK mentor. Just like, you know, like looking at something from the bottom and taking a quick photo or from the bird and then being on top and trying to remember, like, is that the rock? I think it is. It's so and hard. Is this that? And we'd just be there like, I'm like, is this it? <laughs> is this okay, mom? Like, Am I going to make it down alive? Like, it's really scary. And then like when you don't have that confidence and you're kind of backseat, it makes it even more scary. Um, but yeah, she was really helpful and I was really stoked to be out there with her. We're going to take a quick break and talk about one of our sponsors, Autumn Headwear. At Autumn Headwear, style matters. We did an Autumn Bombhole collab beanie. Uh, you've probably seen Buds running it. Not today, but Not most today. days. They got a group of younger riders that have impeccable style. They got Cooper Whittier, Cannon Cummins. Some of the riders with just great style. They got Danimals, his style's out of hand. Great company, snowboarder owned. They got specific fits. They got like a resi fit. They got a sailor Jerry fit for the baby anti-resi, the anti-resi fit. Uh, if you're interested in picking up a great beanie, head on over to autumnheadwear.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk about Bub's Naturals. Now, you know they make the best collagen. We hammer that stuff here at the BOMBHOLE. But Ethan, did you know they're making coffee now? I did. Bub's Brew, the original blend. It's USDA organic, fair trade. Also, it's first ever coffee bean to be Whole30 approved, Chris. The Bub's Naturals namesake derives from Glenn Bub Doherty, who was heroically killed in Benghazi, Libya in 2012. Bub's Naturals is a way of life. They believe wellness is driven from the inside out. Through the spirit of Glenn and a passion for nature's highest quality and sustainably sourced ingredients, We help fuel people to reach their maximum human potential while giving 10% back to charity. Their mission is simple. Feel great. Do good. Head over to bubsnaturals.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order. One thing I think we should talk about, Jamie, is uh, we both used to ride for Solomon. I remember being on trips when we were like little groms. When we thought we were adults, but we were kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, why did you end up leaving Solomon to go over to Mervin and GNU? Yeah, Solomon was actually my sister's and I very first sponsor. Uh, I think it was Alex Pashley back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I really loved Solomon. They were great. We, um, yeah, we had some fun trips, Team Challenge. Um, I think that's who I went to Japan with my first, like, gosh, at like 16 or so. Um, I had an opportunity to ride for Burton back in the day, and I was pretty hyped. It seemed like a good deal. Obviously, Burton is such an amazing brand. So I told Solomon I was going to, you know, take this deal with Burton. And... Somehow in the switch, Burton like pulled the contract and decided they actually didn't want to sponsor me after all. And I was, I think, like 18 at that time. And 
I remember being super bummed. I was like, damn, that sucks. Like, so I went back to Solomon and at that point they had already kind of used that budget to sign other athletes. And I felt like, you know, it's all right. It's a good time to <clears throat> maybe explore some other brands. I want to like ride some different snowboards, um, which is what led me to GNU. And now in hindsight, I'm so grateful that that worked out. Um, but really thankful for Solomon. Was pretty bummed on Burton <laughs> for a while. Still thankfully made quite a bit of cash off their U.S. Opens over the years. <laughs> I think I got my redemption. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna get the money from them one way or another, huh? <laughs> but I'm so happy to be with Mervin. I mean, they're made right here in the U.S. They're all about sustainability and environmental um, ways of producing their products, which is huge. I get to work with Barrett Christie, who I admire and love. And I've gotten to have my own collection of boards for the last 10 years. And I see my boards all over the world, anywhere I travel. And it always, like, brings a really strong connection. I always go over and high-five the chicks or give them a hug and thank them for supporting uh, a brand that really cares. And even before it was cool to care about the environment, they've always just cared, recycled everything, use castor bean oil on the top sheets and recycle the metal on the freaking edge like they really care all their art is plant-based like watercolors it's been really cool to work with sarah king her art's amazing um i have the freedom to do my own art which i'm like working on for my new collection and yeah shout out to gnu i really love them perfect fit is there a lesson for any young athletes that are kind of at the prime of their career like did you leave Sol solomon too early yeah, I think there's definitely a lesson of maybe not taking a deal that seems better and maybe deciding like what feels better for your brand. I think that I kind of got inspired with like the shiny Burton offer and like obviously they're one of the leading brands in our industry and despite it not working out, I still have respect for the company and everything they've done for snowboarding. But, you know, like Solomon has also done a lot of great things. And they were my very first sponsor at like 15 years old. <clears throat> and before I signed with GNU, there's probably five plus years of not having a sponsorship. And that's a lot of like wasted brand engagement and like a lot of like memories you could have created and like things you could have built with that brand. So I would say advice to young ones is like stick with the people who have your back <laughs> and also trust that like one path will lead you to the next. Um, but yeah, stay Was, was there an actual like shiny contract in front of you? It was a shiny verbal <laughs> agreement. A verbal. <laughs> shiny verbal. Isn't and also don't leave one brand without a signed contract. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It was one. like there was just no actual contract you and you're like, that. I'm ready to do this. And they're like, what contract? You need that. Yeah. You need that, you yeah, need that docu sign. sign in the well, there inbox. Was, was there a docu sign when she was eighteen? I don't Probably know. Maybe not. that was part of the Probably problem. Not. Yeah, no docu no. sign back then. Now we got to talk about another one of your sponsors because there is a short list of things I wouldn't do to ride for th this brand. Maybe kill somebody. <laughs> That's about it. That's pretty much it as far as what I wouldn't do to ride for this brand. Uh, we're talking about Skidoo. You talking about Fart Boys? Oh, Skidoo. <laughs> Skidoo. Okay. We're talking about Skidoo. Uh, BRP. So you got a? Uh, they they give you a turby or what? What are Ooh. we talking here? You got a turbo? I got a turbo. Oh my god! I'm so thankful. I have two turbos. Actually. Two turbos. Jesus Christ! The Gen Four and Gen Five. You got two turbos. I'm sitting on an old 2019 relic, naturally aspirated over here. It's might as well be in a in a museum. This thing. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Gosh, that <laughs> situation, terrible. manifestation in the works. I actually, I'm friends with Leticia and she was sharing a bunch of stuff about sea dues and I reached out. I'm like, yo, like, and I don't usually ask people for their plugs, but with her and I, it was different because we're in two different sports and we have like mutual respect. But I was like, yo, who's the sea dew plug? And she, you know, shared the contact. I reached out to my guy there and he, we just had a really cool conversation, shared with him some of my interests. So that partnership actually started with like their water sea dew units and evolved to snowmobiles, obviously, with my passion for exploring the mountains. 
but it's really new and I'm really grateful. They have a lot of great ambassadors and I was like pretty scared to share with them about the pregnancy because I literally had just gotten a turbo and I'm like so pregnant. I could barely snowmobile. I got a couple days out this year, but I was a little bit like, you know, it's kind of scary to be a woman in this sport and have to share to all your partners that you're pregnant and it shouldn't be that way at all, but it definitely was. I feel so happy that all my sponsors have been really supportive through this whole transition, um, especially Skido. They were like, and I don't know the team personally. It's just been a lot of like phone calls and emails, but I was scared to tell them and they were so supportive. They're like, this is music to our ears. Like we want more like family content and, um, yeah, so that was like a blessing that they're super cool. We did like a shoot in Wiss earlier this season. Um, Tyler's been loving it. He's pretty much a pro snowmobiler. <laughs> He's, I'll tell you this, I was there for his learning curve of like getting a snowmobile to like figuring it out. And yeah. it was the arc was just like a hockey stick. Like he was so good. <laughs> at learning how to snowmobile because he has the moto fundamentals mm. that that kid's a natural born he's born to to uh ride a sled and and he's actually really mad at me that i don't have a turbo too so sorry tyler. <laughs> he's mad at oh, you and tyler did submit a guest question uh but it, obviously it was late and i didn't have time to put it in so i'm gonna <laughs> verbally ask you it was something along the lines that you guys have spent a lot of time well first it was like making fun of me about not having a turbo so <laughs> And then the second part of it is his turbo one of your two. See, he's got the inside. Yes, you know, he's got insider trading. Well, at first I had one turbo, and he's like, "Well, you, babe, you need like two. we, we kind of need two. <laughs> so I went back to ski do and really gracefully asked. Were you them, like, "I need one for each foot"? Here. I just I didn't want a Polaris hand. on the yeah. sled deck. I'm like, we can't. You, can't, you know, that's, that's like false you know, marketing. That's you do not yeah. want a Polaris. You don't want to be putting no, something no, else no. there. That's and, just like yeah. bringing the and the, when we're lapping each other we just we definitely needed two skis true that makes this makes a lot of sense yeah you don't want a polaris that's actually a fact it's a marketing plan yeah, yeah. for marketing <laughs> god forbid you get right. an arctic cat that would be just devastating <laughs> but anyway um oh yeah his question was something along the lines of what is your you know you guys have shared a lot of memories being at contests and riding pow and what is your favorite memory of uh riding with tyler oh my favorite memory, riding with T-Dog. Oh, gosh, there's a lot. Um, I would say my favorite one is the most recent one, which was like a little snowmobile day date in the Whistler backcountry with little baby. I was, uh, I had so much fun, and he was so sweet. He always makes me feel so safe out there. Like, I'm pretty good at snowmobiling but it's obviously anyone that snowmobiles especially in the whistler backcountry it's really scary especially being like six plus months pregnant i was pretty like scared and he just made me feel so safe and we had so much fun we rode some pow we had a nice little lunch date and then watched the sunset from the top and it was my favorite i love being out in the mountains with him especially when it's just him and i and we're not filming and we're not at a contest and we can just like enjoy each other's company it seems like sometimes those moments are far and few between that we're not distracted with other friends or things going on and i really loved it, it made me he makes me laugh so much it's really fun to have a best friend who constantly is making you giggle that's beautiful you guys have, you've had, you know, 20 plus years of your life dedicated to snowboarding. Now you're going to bring this beautiful child in the world. How do you see your life evolving? Oh my gosh. I think, I feel like our life is going to get a lot better. It's been pretty, pretty great and a lot of fun and a lot of adventures, but I feel like it's going to get a lot more wholesome. I think it's going to slow down a little bit in some ways, but... We share so many things that we really love away from snowboarding, like all our summer activities, being out in the mountains, hiking, biking, tons of camping. I think last year I slept under the stars like over 30 days. Like I just like to be outside and I think we're going to continue to do that kind of fun stuff with our little one and just share 
the things we really love and hopefully like reawaken that inner child in us. I feel like that's what I see with my siblings and friends having kids. It just brings you back to like the little things in life that make you happy. So I see it. I see it getting better. I'm pretty excited to be a mom and to have a family with Ty. You tell him you're going to need a third turbo? For the, for the <laughs> they make a baby turbo? <laughs> you're so funny. That's exactly what Ty said. He's like, we're going to need to get a baby <laughs> He said that. <laughs> oh, yeah. He got his first snowmobile when he was three years old. What? Yeah, he had an old ski do, like a tiny, like 50 maybe, Those or a like a 100. Ones. Yeah. I don't know exactly, but... He does love snowmobiling. I think he actually loves it more than snowboarding. <laughs> Three years old out there. In Ontario, he said he just it's loved pinning it. Pinning it across a lake in Ontario. <laughs> yeah. going Three. Straight. No mountains. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. All right, Buzz, I think it's time for the pub beer crap shoot. Oh, so, I can't wait. Go. Welcome to the pub beer crap shoot. What are you drinking there, Buzz? I'm drinking a pub beer, and I'll tell you what is going down smooth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's funny about that, because it is going down <laughs> smooth. <laughs> no, it's delicious, and it's cheap, and it's fun beer, and uh, try it out. Do yourself a favor. Their motto is cheap, fun beer. Check out some pub beer. Great support of the show. You should support them. Now, how this works is you roll the dice, and we tell you what you got you to gotta do. Ten. Oh, perfect one. This is perfect for Jamie. Perfect ten? Perfect ten. What's the biggest prize check you've ever won? That's a good one. Oh, my gosh. She doesn't remember. Well. I'd like to follow that up with what's the biggest appearance check after. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, actually, kind of crazy. That year, I ruptured my spleen and was in the ICU. Uh, was the year I won the biggest check. It was when... There was a Burton Global Open series, and it was a hundred grand. And I think that's part of like what I had in the back of my head was that I was about to win a Volvo, a hundred grand, and then I ate shit and ended up in the hospital. But I still won the hundred grand. So they brought me a check in the ICU in Vermont for hundred G's. Kind of unbelievable. That's at seventeen. <laughs> that's crazy. It was quite the trip. At seventeen, no less. Respect. Now, <laughs> did you have sponsors match? What are we talking? We get yeah. you get any bonuses that's a, there? Let's, that's let's, a let's, crazy let's match. get into that. Gosh, that I don't remember. I don't think you weren't even of age. Yeah, I think I like barely I... kind of had sponsors, but it was like but I didn't have an agent. I don't think at that time. So the deals I had were probably pretty like mediocre. Um, did they bring an oversized check into the hospital? It was an oversized Sick. check and an oversized card that Liam Griffin made, and he had everyone at the open sign. I remember having, like, oh, I was so emotional, and I was so I was so thankful to, like, I don't know, snowboarding is such a great community, even though there can be times where it feels a little isolating and separated. I think when push comes to shove it's such a sick community and there's so many people that are just there for you especially when times are tough and that time was pretty like surreal because I was still young I didn't know a lot of the people in the industry and I was kind of like my, making my way up but that was a really good moment in time and also a moment where my mom and I had like a really beautiful time to bond because growing up having so many siblings, I didn't really have a lot of like one on one time with my parents. So we all kind of like helped raise each other. And she always came to Vermont because that's where she was from and she loved it. But through that experience, we like got really, really close. And any like 17 year old girl knows that at that point, you kind of hate your parents. <laughs> I just wanted to like do my thing and have freedom, but I had so much appreciation for her and I think everything in my life at that time because there's so much fear of like maybe not coming out on the other side. And uh, yeah, we had some good quality time together during that recovery. It's special. That's cool. Uh, you know what I was thinking about, Buds? Tell me. Is, uh, have you ever seen Happy Gilmore? Seen it. When he's <laughs> winning all the the golf tournaments on his rise to the mm -hmm. top. 
He's driving around his car, and it's just filled with oversized checks. <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel like Jamie's yeah. career was. Her whole career. He's just driver. He's just got <laughs> oversized checks coming out of every... Trying to show up at the drive through at the bank, getting that thing through the little slot. I don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> it's so funny, because I did... I had a huge stack of checks, because they always used to give, give you those in events. And I'm like, I'm always giving stuff away or trying to clean out my garage, uh, donating gear, et cetera. But I remember at one point, I like... I tried to get rid of all the checks. I was like, I don't need these. Like, fucking get them out of here. They're just collecting dust. And my dad, like, he's he saves everything. And I, like, found that he has all my old checks, including, like, <laughs> that 100 them. grand one. And I'm so thankful a, that he yeah, kept them. You want that. Yeah, like, fill a... I don't know. Do something with them. Wallpaper or room or something. That'd be cool. Shout out to my pop. So he. Especially the hundred grand one. Yeah. That's, like that's if you're going to save one. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Jamie, of all the awards that you've won, you're about to win another one. It's from the bomb hole. Handmade. <laughs> As you can tell, we wrapped it. We oh. wrapped it ourselves. <laughs> a bomb hole wrap job for those of you. Here, that's I'll a good wrap I'll give it to you to open. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys. So it's uh, more sweet. prestigious than the Olympic gold, yes. bud, would you say? It's even cooler than a hundred grand check, too. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? The side facing out the front. You're, you gotta see the other side. The, <gasps> the go goat? The goat award. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love you guys. Thank you. Love you too, This Jamie. is amazing. This is really special. So for the listeners, it's a metal saw spray painted gold that says the goat on it. The goat. That's yeah. uh, quite the honor. Thank you. I have a Patreon I question to go it. with it from Todd O'Hare. And he says, as the current goat of woman snowboarding, what would you like to be known for when you're an old head or retired? Oh. I'll put this art piece right there. <laughs> um, what would I like to be known as? Gosh, hopefully hopefully a beacon of light, you know, it doesn't really matter about the awards you have and the money or the trophies or whatever, but hopefully people remember me as a kind, loving person who can hopefully uplift their day. I think you're already doing that every day. So mission, a, a, mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. Done deal. What's next? <laughs> All right. Well, um, we're going to get into hot takes. So, uh, first thing we like to ask is the MJ and or goat of snowboarding, both male and female. Who the goat's goat. Yeah, who's the goat's goat? Mm. Who's the goat's goat? For men, I think Travis Rice. He's a goat all around. I love what he's doing right now with just not only being an incredible athlete himself, but giving back to the community and always like um, – just creating more for others. I think he's very, like, he's admirable. And for women, I'm the fucking goat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, right answer. I mean, you guys guided me to that one. I don't think I would have said that without my new God, beautiful so trophy. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I was thinking about it. I was like, Ty, what am I gonna say about the goat? Like, I I don't know. He's like, you're the fucking goat. <laughs> like, you just need to go in there and own it. I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. But you guys really made it easier, so thank you. It's, it's true. But before I thought of myself, I thought if it was someone I was looking up to, I was gonna say Victoria Jealous, because. Just to do that kind of writing back in the day before any woman was doing it is really amazing. And she's a beauty. And I still love watching her video parts and getting inspiration. Great answer. <clears throat> but All thank right. you. That's really an honor. When I first heard people call me a goat, like, I, I was like, what the fuck is, why is everyone saying goat? Like, what is this goat emoji? And then I realized what it was. What does it mean? <laughs> what is it? Everybody like, a goat? Like, I, don't, I don't turn. get it. You're like, I, I do hike well in Alaska. I get around <laughs> out there. Nimble in the mountains. Mountain goat. Similar to a goat. Uh, all right. For those of you who don't know what goat stands for, it stands for greatest of all time. So, uh, all right. Next, next question. Most underrated. Who you got? Oh, gosh. For men or women, both? Choose Anyone? Your, choose your own adventure. 
Um, underrated. Oh gosh, I'm bad at these questions. I would say um, in the women's field, and it's changing like right now, but Mia Brooks. I met her when I was when she was just 13. And before she had any sponsors, we did a little uh, segment together at Locks, <clears throat> and I went riding with her. And I, I was like, holy shit, this girl is really, really good. And I'm so thankful she's getting some light on her now because she's incredible and probably going to take over in the next couple of years. Um, and for men, gosh, I would say a lot of Canadians are underrated. It's definitely a harder field to be in. Like in some ways I feel like I don't want to be biased, but Ty can be underrated. I think he's so freaking talented and has so much to offer, but I know that it's, it's really tough. Like being, a, he was a contest rider, but now getting into more backcountry and like trying to find like your crew and like all of that, it's been like pretty inspiring to see him and also like going into his piloting career but also like losing sponsors and feeling some ways I feel he's really underrated and then I know that there's so many talented guys but I'm always trying to like send him love and know that he'll connect with the right partners in the right time if he just stays true to himself and doing what he really loves fuck yeah Tyler's so underrated that's a that's a great answer uh okay steel as in rails or powder? Powder. Okay. Best style. Who you got? Mm, Danny Davis. Okay. Favorite board graphic ever made? Mm, favorite board graphic. Oh. Um, I really love my board graphic from Sarah King. Tie-dye art. It's like a pink mandala that goes out i love that board every time i see it it's old but it's beautiful favorite snowboard video ever favorite snowboard video ever follow me around good answer okay worst trend worst trend everyone hating on people cancel culture all around i think we need a shine light on people a little bit more and stay in our own lane. No one's really perfect. Okay. Last, last question. This one's really important. Beanie or toque? <laughs> toque. <laughs> toque. Toque. She went to back to a toque. <laughs> wow. She's flip flopping around. She's basically a Canadian citizen at this point. Mm -hmm. then. All <laughs> residency, you know, I'll be an American. I think they're going to revoke your... Yeah, your, take your passport take back. Take your passport back for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Some really mad Americans for you answering that. What do you think they would do if I went to compete for a different nation like a lot of people do? That would be... Like Canada? Like, uh, I don't know, like Louis with Italy yeah. or Eileen with China. After Canada your, your did career, offer me... Though, that might be a... I'll tell you what, I would be livid. Yeah. <laughs> I would be I would be furious. Yeah. America's dope. Yeah, you, I got an offer for a Canadian passport to compete for them in the last Olympics. Oh, you did. And wow. I really did want a passport. Dude, that's huge getting a Canadian passport. And I respectfully declined. You did. Yeah. But now you're saying <clears throat> And then they like never let me on. Right. The, they never let me on the snow laps with the Canadian team. They kind of like cut me. They're like, "All right, we're not helping you anymore." Wow. But I couldn't. Spiteful. Like, I know, I don't know. I love the world, but I love where I'm from. And, yeah, all the family, all the roots. America Canada's is pretty dope, great. though. America, yeah, Canada's great, too. So I spend a lot of time there. I like the nature. All right, Jamie, we always ask our guests uh, what their setup is, their board and their bindings, and how they set up their board. Um, my setup, I'm riding right now the Free Spirit uh, GNU 148. And I'm writing the new trilogy bindings from Union. And uh, what are your angles? Yeah. Oh, uh, on my pal board, I'm usually like nine in the back and twelve in the front. And park board? Park board, I go nine nine, and like I put my stance pretty close, like center. We're talking duck. Uh, nine negative nine, probably. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh yeah, not nine, posy. Nine negative, nine fret, roughly. It changes. Yeah, depends Mc, on the McDermott tuning tune yeah, those things. Ryan, can you can you help? How what's my angles? <laughs> <laughs> how how do I set up my board again? No. When he was waxing for Canada, he waxed you too. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. He, I, yeah, he's, he's a G. Uh, he's an OG. Gets you over those. Jumps. He actually quick story on that. What uh, did the air horn? break this episode yeah there's a lot sorry about oh, yeah. my lack of air horns as always i gave him one already I think. oh you did yeah, yeah. Right. he waxed my board when i was 13 at border oh border geez. Cross at you didn't even know him yet that yeah before i really knew him my sister knew him and she introed me and he says he re- reminds me that i was so sweet at 13 and because i was so thankful he waxed my board i brought him a salad from the athlete really lounge. like brought him lunch as a thank you and pretty much we've been friends ever since. Gee, he's probably all hungry. No one probably thinks it notes no. him up like that, you know? He's like, that's the sweetest thing he ever <clears throat> brought him a little off. People like just don't, they forget the little things, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th- at the time we're recording this, this is pre-X Games. So I talked to him last night, and he was basically driving to his shop to oh, wax geez. all night. He stays up all everybody's night. Everybody's boards dialed. And it's just a thankless, it's yeah. a thankless job. They and just pick their boards up in the morning without even saying anything. He's like finally no, they're sleeping. Th- they're thankful, I think. Oh, they are thankful. His boards are fast. Yeah, fast as fast. He stays up there all. <laughs> he stays up all night hammering those things. It's incredible. Yeah. Buds, you've ridden a McDermott tune, dude. I could. I almost I fell getting off the lift because it was so fast. It was like stepping on a banana. <laughs> This guy's boards. It makes a difference. Yeah, like, first I was like, like blown away. I was just like, dude, this is crazy. No wonder why these guys are so good at jumping fast and going huge. No one used to like take care of their boards. And then all of a sudden, everyone realized the value in it. Yeah, you have to. If his boards are out there, like if you're not taking care of your board, you're going to be in trouble. For Especially sure. you got snow on the course. It's like a little little bit of inch of duff where you can't quite get the speed. You need That's that. make or break. And right he's there. studying he's, the weather and knows what's going to happen with scientist. the temperatures. Yeah. He's got a meat thermometer in the snow. Yeah. <laughs> he does. Turkey baster. He's ready to Turkey go. Turkey baster's out. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk uh, next next thing before we wrap this thing up. Uh, do you want to throw any thank yous? Oh, got a lot of thank yous. Um, I won't like go crazy with it, but I would say. Thank you to all my family and Tyler. A uh, huge thank you to all my sponsors making this dream a reality and having my back all these years. Um, thank you to you guys for having this space and sharing everyone's stories. And uh, uh, I don't know. Thank you to Mama Nature for letting us all go play in the mountains. Tahoe looks insane right now. I'm so excited to go um, be in the snow. And, yeah, thank you to all the fans out there who support and care about what we do. It wouldn't be possible without all that love. So thank you to everyone watching. Appreciate that. Um, One last thing. We do have a print. It's probably sold out, but it's a shot by Mike Yoshida. Uh, It's an incredible photo of you in Japan. And uh, if you want to support Mike Yoshida, head on over to MikeYoshida.com. He sells prints over there. He's got all kinds of bangers. A lot like Bud's. Bud's also has, uh, what is it, E-Stone Photo? Yeah. Dot com? E-Stonephoto.com. Support these photographers. Um, sorry to derail. Uh, but we are going to get into one last question before we wrap it up. If you could go back in time and give advice to your 10-year-old self just getting into snowboarding, what would you tell yourself? Oh... Oh, gosh. I would tell myself to just have fun and not worry about what everyone thinks. Wise words. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us, sharing your story, inspiring millions uh, of snowboarders all around the world, and just doing what you do. So I just want to say thank you for coming on here. Thank you for having me, guys. Good to finally be in this legendary booth. (laughs) We appreciate you. We appreciate all of our listeners, all of our Patreon members, all of our sponsors, our snowboarding community. So thank you guys so much. Uh, we got another episode coming at you next Wednesday. Over and out from the bomb hole.